Oh, sorry, we're a little bit late here. Um, welcome to uh, Gas Mass and Hand Grenades. It's uh, my name's Jeff, as most of you know. That uh, check these out uh, tonight. We've got a, a great panel here. We're going to talk about a band called Agalock, and uh, we've got a, a nice panel of uh, guests tonight. Just to let everybody know that Eli may or may not be attending tonight. He's got some uh, some issues where he had to stay late at work, so he's going to try to pop in a little later. Might even get uh, Dreadful Rick might even pop in briefly, so uh, we'll see how that rolls. But tonight, I'm joined by uh, Logan, who's a, uh, a virgin to the gas mask uh, and hand grenades this show. So uh, I say be gentle. <laughs> yes, I will. I'll okay. be gentle. Thank you. And then we've got another virgin here. We've got Ryan from, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's Logan from Drunken Metalhead Musings YouTube channel, and we've got Ryan from Ave Moors. Is that how you pronounce it? That is correct. Nailed okay, it. cool. Ryan's a virgin as well to the program, and I appreciate you joining me tonight, Ryan. And then I got an old uh, standby here who's been like at, on, seems like every single episode that I've done the last couple of months. <laughs> We got Jimmy with me from Future Runes. I appreciate you guys being here tonight. So, um, on, guys. how's everybody doing? Doing real good. Great. Sorry cool. to talk about this band. Cool. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna jump into this band. Let me just get my orientation correct here. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about Agalock tonight, and um, you know, this is a band that um, I think a lot of you know a lot of people. Or a lot of when they kind of came onto the scene in 98, 99, um, we, um, they were kind of labeled a black metal band and an American black metal band in particular, to be more precise. And, um, you know, going back through this catalog, which it's been quite a while for me since I visited this stuff, um, and I gotta say, I, I don't know if I really completely agree with that particular genre uh, name for them because I, I think they encompass a lot more than just black metal. There's certainly black metal in their music, but you know, for me, I hear I hear a lot of post metal, a lot of post rock. I hear I even hear a lot of a good bit of '80s style you know uh what i i term like joy division things like i hear those influences in this music i think just to call them a black metal band is kind of disingenuous there's a lot more going on here there's ambient there's dark ambient in their music there's a lot of neo folk there's a lot of folk americana i kind of almost in a weird weird way hear bands like I hear them being a, a major influence on bands like Wayfair, for example. Um, so anyway, we're, we're going to dig back into these guys. But uh, for, for you know, the, the people watching here, how about we start off and we talk, to, uh, we talk about where we came in to this band or how we came upon this band. And uh, Logan, I think I'm going to start with you because you're the young, youngster among us here. I think I'm pretty seems, sure. Seems fair, yeah. I, and uh, so your perspective on it might be a little bit different than maybe Jimmy and Ryan mine, because I'm the old guy. Here. And it so, probably uh, is. And I, yeah, I so, realize that when you come in, makes like a world of a difference of how you view a band always. and like the lens that you're looking at, like their discography and releases from. So absolutely. I uh, I first discovered them in 2012. I was a freshman in college. And uh, I was going to uh, school a couple states away from like where I spent basically the majority of my life. And in uh, Mississippi, of all places, I felt kind of isolated and uh, I guess kind of like depressed down there. And definitely the music of Agalock, specifically their first album, Pale Folklore, really spoke to me during that, that whole just year uh at college especially because I, I found them in in december during the winter break and mm -hmm. it was just really love at first listen and honestly they were like the first black metal band which we can address that for sure mm -hmm. at some point if i could you know can actually use that term or not but 
in my at the time i was like wow this is the first black metal band that's actually really clicking with me like up to that point i had tried uh transylvanian hunger by dark throne uh the mysterious dom satanus by mayhem and uh oh the demu borgir album with the uh the decapitated naked lady on the oh misanthropic misanthropic euphoria yeah right yeah and none of those like i appreciated especially probably the mayhem album like funeral fog and uh the freezing moon are for sure awesome. I appreciated it, but never like really clicked with me at that point. But as soon as I heard the opening like guitar line into uh, she painted fire across the skyline, I was just head over heels. And yeah, they kind of really became like almost like an event for me. Like, the first I, year of college was what year for you? Twenty twelve. You said twenty twelve. Yeah. Okay. And like I there that album was so special that I honestly I I waited a whole year till the next winter to buy their next album, The Mantle. And then I did that the next for the next uh two albums after that. No kidding. Basically. Just because yeah. I love just how special it made their music seem and you know, it made it look really like an event. And from the get go, I will say I had a connection of their music with just being outside and in I don't want to say hiking because like my hiking back then was like literally I just we had a bunch we were the my family's home was on a lake so it was just like walking around the lake you know around that December seems apropos, yeah. and it it just formed that connection of Agaloc and just being outside and being in like a, a cold natural environment and that's something I've tried to maintain with their music too but I, nice. that's a starting point for me, I'd say. Cool. Ryan, how about you? Yeah, so um, I think I'm a year older than you, but I actually got into Agaloc much later. Um, in 2010, I had a bandmate recommend uh, Marrow of the Spirit to me. Weird weird album to jump into Agaloc with, I think. Um, yeah, that was, probably. That and like Serpent in the Sphere, pretty divisive records as far as I can tell. Um, I loved it. I loved it immediately. And I'd never heard anything like that. I wasn't especially into black metal and I'd love to delve more into the genre of classification too. Cause I agree completely. It's it, they're not just a black metal band. Um, yeah. We're going to definitely do that here. Yeah. Um, so wait, when you said you're a year older than you met, you're older than Logan, right? Then Logan. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, cause there's no I started college in 2011. Yeah. There's no fucking way you're a year older than me. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Father, Father Time isn't a year older than me at this point. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yes, then, then Logan. So. Okay. I thought you were probably, I thought you were a little closer in age to like, I thought you were probably like late 30s, actually. So, I, I'll, I'll just take that as a comment on my maturity. And absolutely. Yeah. It is. It's the beard. It absolutely it, it, it is, honestly. The beard ages you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I heard Mayor of the Spirit and I loved it. And I don't think I really started to dig into them until college probably 2013 is when i had my like black metal renaissance where i just realized it was like my favorite type of music in the world and um i started to really dig into them and i just fell in love with the band they're 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 a top five band for me easily um like of all time just one of the greatest bands i've ever heard and especially now that i live on the west coast i feel very like just connected to what what they're doing with their music um true i mean there was they're a West Coast band, you know, although we'll get into that in a sec. I'll do a history in a minute after Jimmy and I throw our uh, where we came into the band from. But uh, yeah, and but and once I do the history thing, then we'll we will talk a little bit about what we perceive the band to be as far as as a genre, genrefication, if you will. But um, and then we'll jump into the albums. Jimmy, you have all the albums, right? Do you have the EPs and stuff, too? Yeah. Uh, okay. Pick up, yeah. Bunch of stuff. All right. I haunted for my stuff and I could not find them because you know all my stuff boxed up and I'm kind of bummed because I did want to show that Ashes special limited edition, but oh well. Um, so how about you, Jimmy? I mean, I know this band's pretty special to you. So wh where did you come in on the, the Agaloc train? Yeah, I've got uh, a lot of history with the band. Um, I learned about them um, probably right when they came out. And uh, well, I mean, so Pale Folklore would have been 1999, I believe. And uh, 
I think yeah. it was probably 2000, the first time I heard them. And, uh, you know, I, I was kind of prompted to go listen to them as a result of reading this review here. Ah. Oh. See that? So this is a, a Metal Maniacs. Uh, Look at that. Nice. Uh, so, cool. you know, to put it in their perspective, Shaw Diner was still alive. Um, right. Oh, yeah. Type O Negative was still going. Um, Cannibal was probably releasing Bloodthirst at this point. Um, but um, I, uh, you know, probably I, I used, I mean, this was where I learned about a lot of music. And so I, I came across this review and I instantly was struck by that image there. Um, you know, there was something about it that just oh yeah, yeah. Uh, spoke to me. Just I thought it was very, I don't know, evocative, just, I mean, uh, you know, sort of beautiful. And like, you know, at the time I wasn't really any into any kind of like, you know, sort of black metal music or anything, but, um, and lo and behold, who wrote this, uh, review, uh, let me see if I can find it there. Hang you on, see? Let me pull up. Can you see that? Yeah, it's Marty. No shit. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, believe it or not. Um, How so about Marty that? actually was the catalyst to me getting into this band and, uh, sort of like kind of my history with Marty. Like I, I used to, I, I really liked his writing in this, this, magazine so when i first met marty uh like on these streams i kind of made a fool of myself and kind of fanboyed on him so ah. uh, because you know I, I liked his writing in metal maniacs and plus i'm a huge binary uh, recordings fan so but yeah. anyway um you know so i read the review and uh i think it was really just this image here that really kind of like prompted me to really want to go listen to this and at the time I, I wasn't into any kind of like you know more of the the, the black metal stuff except maybe like emperor and Dimmu borger i mean uh you know this we're talking 2000 here so um i i don't even remember how i listened to it because back then you didn't have Bandcamp or anything i must have like downloaded it on napster or, or right peer uh, peer thing right. audio galaxy but uh i was i was instantly kind of blown away by it. i mean i didn't uh you know we'll kind of talk about it when we get to pale folklore but um the, i mean i was still living in new orleans louisiana at the time so um i think that you know from childhood i had a sort of um you know, th there was a seed within me in terms of like wilderness and nature, you know, like my parents took me on a, uh, a trip to Colorado when I was young and we went to Mesa Verde National Park. And um, I think there was things there that kind of spoke to me as a child that uh, that, that kind of stuck with me, though I never really kind of fully realized I was getting older. I mean, 2000, I was probably, you know, my early 20s. Um, but there was something about this and you know that that was instantly was that picture and then going on and listen to the music um that's where i kind of come into it uh early on and it, you know there's there's more history there but that's you know to start it off i hate to ask is that um what is that picture of though is that the album cover to that's um that's Fail? the bass player that's the bass player jason walton um, oh okay and uh it's just him in the forest with a with a deer skull kind of oh. in front of his face and okay. uh, like in the woods and and uh so if you look at the album pictures, there's different uh, sort of settings for each of the, the band members in terms of like, in a, you know, sort of a, a nature wilderness kind of setting. Okay. Uh, From so yeah. Pale Folklore? That's yeah. right. Okay. All right. Because it's been a long time since I opened it up and I didn't remember that. Ah, there it is. Okay. I see. Let me pull yep. that up. In my, yeah. There we go. There we go. Cool. Yeah. I didn't remember that. Um, so for me... Uh, I'm right around where you were, Jimmy. Although for me, it was it was um, uh, the mantle that, you know, as an older dude, I was already into my 30s at this point in 2001, probably you know early 30s, and um, I had kind of begrudgingly come into the world of black metal and extreme metal and death metal begrudgingly kicking and screaming around 2000, 2001 with Blackwater Park. That was the, the album that was like, oh, yeah, there's something here that I was missing. Now, I was aware of bands like Deicide and Cannibal and all the Florida death metal stuff, death and, and Possessed and things like that. But, man, I just struggled with it because of the vocals for the longest time. And But suddenly when Blackwater Park opened the floodgates for me, it was like, oh, I just couldn't get enough of this. I had, you know, every... Everything that, you know, Ulver was a big one. Those first three albums from Ulver were right around that period of time. And I I think, I unlike you, I did not read about it in Metal Maniacs. I think I might have read about it in, like, Brave Words or, I, or maybe Kerrang. I think it was probably Brave Words, though. 
And I saw that, like you, the striking image of the mantle. Somebody hold up the mantle, if you will, quick for me. Um, that cover photo of, I believe that's in Portland. I believe that's a statue somewhere in Portland. Um, and I saw that, and I'm like, ah, that's kind of intriguing. Now, at, to that point, the only black metal I really knew was probably Oliver, Mayhem, maybe Emperor, and a little bit of Immortal. Those were the bands. And I don't think Agalog sounds like any of those bands, quite frankly. Um, and I remember reading about, you know, reading an interview, or not an interview, a review on the man on, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to grab that thing. Because I shopped at the End Records a lot back in those days. I dropped a lot of money at that place. You know, Dissection, um, Opeth stuff, Anathema stuff. Those were big, you know, early gets for me. And man, when I got the mantle, I just remember it just didn't come out of my CD player in my car for months. You know, it was just the go-to jam for me. So, um, and then I, of course, you know, at that point, I grabbed Pale Folklore and of Stone. Uh, yeah, yeah. I always say that thing wrong. What is it? A pillar stone? Oh, a pillar stone and wind, yes. right? Wind, right? Yep. So, uh, yeah. And then going forward, then I stayed with the band. And um, so, speaking about the band, I'm going to use my cheat sheet here real quick and do a little quick history. Um, so, yeah. Of course, I don't have my uh, notes open to the page I wanted to be open at, though. There we go. So this band was formed in 1995 um, by John Holm. Is it Holm or Hogham? Holm, right? I've always said Holm. It's Holm, yeah. I, it's Holm. I, I believe it's Holm, yeah. And Shane Breyer. Uh, John Holm was a multi-instrumentalist, and Shane Breyer was the, uh, was, played keyboards. In 1996, Don Anderson joins the band, uh, and they, they work on their first demo which was called From Which of This Oak. They were then joined by Jason William Walton on bass in late 96. And in 1998, the trio of Holm, Anderson Williams, I'm sorry, and Breyer, recorded a new demo called Promo 98, which was solely for label consumption. As a result of that Promo 98, they were signed by the, the End Records out of Salt Lake City. Uh, they recorded and released Pale Folklore in 1999. And at that point, Briar departed the band after recording this album. Uh, I didn't really find out why. It sounded like it was the musical difference, just I'm not really into this anymore type thing. If you guys know any more, certainly add it. <coughs> um, and uh, let's see what else. They recorded and released four more full-length albums, five EPs. And uh, in May, on May 13th of 2016, they disbanded. Palm forming Pelorian, Anderson Walton, and Decker formed Corada. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Uh, Pelorian released their album Obsidian, Obsidian on March 10th, 2017, and Corada debuted with an album called Salt, which was released on 7-20-2018. So, um, yeah, um, that's the basic thumbnail sketch of the band, and we can get into that as we go through each album when we get to the point where things change but um anyone want to add anything to the history there that you might know yeah, I was told, I, yeah they were real quick though i was told that they were formed in portland oregon uh, wikipedia says that however eli who unfortunately isn't with us does know aesop 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 decker yeah and apparently sent him a text message and aesop said they really formed kind of in butte montana initially and then moved out to Portland. So I don't know if that's really true or not, but I would think Aesop would know more than Wikipedia would know. You never know. So go ahead. Who's up? Jimmy, you can go. I was just going to say Don Anderson and uh, Hom, I think both were from Montana originally. And I think Hom moved to Portland first and maybe Jason stayed in Montana, but I think Don lived in Portland. And I also think Shane Breyer... I don't know if he was, I mean, like, I guess they always call him a member of the band, but he didn't really contribute a whole lot other than those like sort of keyboard interlude, yeah, things, keyboard yeah. interlude yeah. things. Yeah. Which, you know, like, uh, in my mind are amazing, but, uh, oh, yeah, they're incredible. I don't know if he was ever like really truly, uh, and there's also, uh, one project you kind of, uh, you might not have seen, uh, Briar had a project with 
Jason Walton, the bassist, called Susurus Inasis, I think. Exactly. And that's kind of like if you like Briar's stuff on the first, you know, record, the, the, you know, it's, it's all like keyboard uh, ambient. Kind of, I don't even want to call it ambient. It's just atmospheric. Uh, yeah, just atmospheric keyboard stuff. Like, yeah. keyboard yeah. stuff. Um, he did a whole like album of that with Jason Walton. And you can okay. get it on Bandcamp if you're interested, if you like that stuff. Um, there's a whole album. I didn't even know that until about like five years either. ago. Because I really enjoyed his contributions and had no idea when, and it's pretty good. It's not as good as what he did for Agaloc, but it's but it's kind of in that same vein. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Ryan, do you want to add anything? I have nothing to add except that Montana still makes sense as a place for yeah. Andrew started, given the the incredible wilderness up there. Yeah. Well, the origin. I know. I know John is from Butte. I believe he was you know raised and lived there. I actually thought it was Jason that was from there, and you said. Um, oh, you said that Don is from Portland, Jimmy. I believe he is. Yeah. Okay. All right. So why they, why they got there and how they got there. I'm not really certain that, mm -hmm. that part I, I wasn't sure about. How about you, uh, Logan? Do you have something to add there? Yeah. The one thing I was going to add is they were actually Anderson and Hom were in a band before Agalot called Sculptor, which is like a progressive death metal band, which I, I didn't find, I didn't realize this until preparing for this stream. But uh, I don't think Hom necessarily recorded anything. He was the drummer for the band. Like, but I'm pretty sure Anderson might have stayed with the band throughout their whole uh, discography. And they have four albums out. Yeah, I, I which knew about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to listen to it at some point now. I knew I about Sculpture. Yeah, I knew about Sculpture. I, I thought that was Don's band initially. Like it was his band. Um, mm -hmm. I actually did not know that Hom was in that band. That's the I, first I knew that. Yeah, I don't even know if he's actually has a credit. I just know there was him and I guess Don Anderson in in it originally. Yeah, and then from there I think Agaloc took developed. Shape. Well, that's what that's what yeah. it, from my Wikipedia finding. Right, right. Yeah, I'm always leery of Wikipedia though because you just this never know that you know. But it is the quick is reference. Fair. You know what I mean? Well, but mm -hmm. actually, Sculptured was the was Don's first band. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think Agaloc was primarily Hom's project. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like it was really him until he brought in those other guys. But right. you know, Don was focusing on sculpture before that. But uh, I think knowing that uh, sculpture was Don's main band, and that they're like a more of a progressive, melodic, you know, death metal band, it makes some of the guitar playing and like his choices, especially in pale yes. folklore, it make may, may, you know makes it makes more sense i guess you know like some of the guitar lines and melodies he uses yeah i, I did notice more. on metal archives it does say portland so i'd probably trust that a little bit more than i trust wikipedia but who knows whoever put it on wikipedia probably got it from metal archives so mm -hmm. um yeah so let's talk a little bit about before we jump into the albums real quick here let's talk a little bit about you know where what we perceive this band to be as far as the genre i mean again i hear uh, so much post-rock and i'll use post-rock and post-metal kind of synonymously because i think they kind of go hand in hand in a lot of ways um you know there was a big push in those early to mid 2000s by a lot of different bands that you know you had your isis's and your neuroses which had more of a sludgy kind of post-metal sound and then you had your bands like Explosions in the Sky, which, you know, had that epic grant and, and in the trees. And you know, they had a more epic sort of grandiose sort of uh, a style of, of sound. Um, but of course, I think it's really important to note that one of the things I think that John really kind of brought to the fore in his in this project was his acoustic playing. There's a lot of acoustic interludes, a lot of clean guitar as opposed to the super distorted stuff um so what what do you guys think about that like give me your your takes on it. jimmy what what do you where do you kind of pigeonhole them if you yeah, have I, mean, to? I guess if you kind of look at the beginnings of of their music i mean and it's kind of interesting because like you know when you listen to the the first record it's like it's already pretty developed in terms of uh you know like the different influences and you know a lot of people refer to Oliver, you know, that, that, you know, sort of pale folklore was like a, you know, an Oliver, you know, uh, directly tied to Bergtat, which yes. I've always, which is clearly the case. I think, I think Agalock is a, is a perfect example of a band that took an influence from something and really kind of shaped it into something of their own, which is what I feel 
from, uh, right. from the, from the music. But I mean, there was obviously that underlying, um, you know, sort of black metal element, <clears throat> which gave him that sort of cred. But I always thought there was so much more of it because I think the post side of things was kind of more. They've always cited the band Godspeed You Black Emperor, which yes. I'm with. Um, Huge. But I know that that was a big one for them. Um, but then there's also, you know, also that sort of neo folk uh, element, which I don't know. You know, I'm not really um, an expert in neo folk, but um, I, I wonder if Sylvain might be able to chime in on this. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously that was a that was a big element of it, and it was kind of important in order to you know uh, show that sort of side that where they're you know the music is supposed, supposed to evoke wilderness and, and nature and um sort of like the the antithesis of um you know modern like social life i guess so um yeah i don't know man i mean i think you can definitely find a lot of influences from a lot of different things because i know these guys were very uh schooled in very different types of music uh, but especially um just metal in general i mean i know they were huge you know metallica fans or whatever and you know they, they just brought a lot of different things to it. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, there a lot of the, the guitars are kind of that dual guitar attack in a way. Like it's not really an attack, but it is sort of like a dual, like harmonizing kind of thing that where they, you know, they, they, they kind of layer the guitars on top of each other on different, you know, uh, notes of the scale to where it just sounds like it's a harmony. Um, you know, you could, you can, you can say that that's a very much an influence from Iron Maiden or something. I was just going to say, man, if you, I don't know if you, if you guys did, but I had never listened to the demos, and I went back and listened to the demos. And the very first demo uh, is, man, it's straight up new album worship all the way through. You hear Thin Lizzy, you hear Priest, you hear Maiden for sure, um, but you have the black, the element of the black metal with the vocals, the raspy vocals, and some of the blast beat. There's not a lot of blast beats on those early, early demos. Um, and in fact, if you go through their recording history. There's a lot of there's there's moments of blast beats, but it's rarely as a track overwhelmed with blast beats ever with Agalog. And I'm really glad you brought up Godspeed, man, because that is I, I totally forgot that one. But that's huge, man. And I'm a major Godspeed guy. I loved those first two the two EPs and then the full lengths, the first like three full lengths, you know, like lift your skinny wrists and um Yankee XO. I mean, it's so F sharp. Uh, what's it called? F sharp infinity, I believe. Um, yeah, totally there. Totally there. I also hear Rush in the very early, uh, some Rush, not like a major influence, but it definitely is there. There's, there's a Rush influence. So how about you, uh, you, uh, Logan, what, what do you hear there? So definitely all of the influences that you're talking about for sure. Uh, I, but I, I almost think you kind of have to go album by album a little bit because they're one of those bands that well, they did not. Well said. They're, they, especially those first three, they very much moved linearly from album to album and like all the jumps kind of made sense. I think you can really see all the distinct influence and stuff the most on Pale Folklore and especially the new album and the uh I, I i as i was saying i pick up some melodic death metal and stuff for sure but i i still think the backbone for pale folklore i would i would still say like black metal like as the act like the overall backbone like i would still well, sure. call I mean, that a black metal album as but soon as said berg taught you know yeah, a huge and, influence no question that's and, definitely and, it um how about you, Ryan? What uh, what do you, what are you hearing here? Because you had some thoughts on that. I, mean. I have, yeah, I actually have a lot of thoughts. I'm gonna try to stay organized, but go for uh, it. I have heard that they they liked the term dark metal to describe their sound early on in their career. Um, I don't know if they came up with that or if that was like a reference to something else that was going on at the time. But I think I think that's it, it, they really do kind of defy classification in a, in a way. Um, so I you know I, I can see why they would make up their own sound. Um, I would. I would say for me, Agalock was actually my gateway into neo-folk. Um, hearing neo-folk bands that didn't really click for me before after hearing Agalock uh, made it make a lot more sense as a genre. Um, I, I kind of had the, I you know, I had the software at that point to understand what was going on in this genre and sort of appreciate it more. Um, I, I kind of, for me, Agalock is just, it, it, I call them a folk metal band. Um, 
that's not really what people think of when they hear folk metal, but I think it's American folk metal, um, especially because folk metal draws heavily on black metal anyway. It almost to the point where you could call it a subgenre, maybe a black metal. So I, I think the black metal influence is still queer. Um, I really don't know many other metal bands that incorporate folk metal or folk to that extent in metal, and especially in the American scene. Uh, you got to consider they're like Agalox contemporaries were like Weakling and Judas Iscariot and yeah. yep. uh, Leviathan around that time. Like those are not like nothing like those pretty bands. bands nothing at all. like Agalox. Like, no, ugly, no grimy bands. Right, Weakling maybe had like some like beauty in it, but like still, it's like very harsh music. So like Agalock was doing something very different, and they're such an important band for American black metal and just metal in general. Um, well, I, th I think honestly. you bring up you bring up a good point. There's there's a I think there's a good bit of Americana in their music too. Yeah, you, you can hear you can hear especially because of the folk influence. You can hear the John Prine. You can hear the. Mm -hmm. You know the the um, Hank not Hank Williams, but what's his name? Woody Guthrie. Um, you can kind of hear those those folk influences really take shape with John's acoustic passages. And you know we're going to talk about you know they cover a Death in June uh, song. I've never really dove deep into Death in June, but I do know that they are an Australian band that has a very folky, dark folk sort of vibe to them and. Uh, that was an important influence, I believe, in, in what John was listening to. John was also into a lot of ambient music, too, back then. And that takes shape in various forms on these albums as you progress forward, especially the EPs. So, um, yeah, for me, the, you know, again, I, I, I think they kind of, like you said, Ryan, they almost defy classification in a lot of ways because there's numerous different things going on here that aren't, they certainly weren't like mayhem or you know which was that raw hateful evil sounding black metal and they weren't like emperor which was kind of the other side which was the grandiose progressive almost astral sounding uh black metal and they weren't like immortal who were a lot more sort of you know deathy on their first album and then just sort of you know that tremolo pick blast beady stuff and the you know, Abbott, there was a lot more going on here. And also the fact that when John was singing in his, his black metal vocals, he also interspersed a lot of clean vocals within the, the, these, these songs. And dare we say, there weren't a lot of tracks that were under eight, nine, 10, 12 minutes on their early material. In fact, there really wasn't any throughout most of their career until maybe serpent really at the end. Um, so, yeah, interesting perspectives there and uh, probably why I gravitated a lot to these guys because, you know, my early black metal probably was Emperor, Ulver. Uh, I never was really a big uh, dissection, the second wave stuff. Um, you know, and I would say in a lot of ways that they had a little bit more akin or, or in line with the, the second wave black metal bands than they did with the first wave black metal bands, in my opinion. That's just what I hear. So, um, all right, man, that's cool. That's good stuff. Um, we ready to jump into albums? As I said, the, the first uh, demo from Which of This Oak came out in 97 uh, on First Light of Dawn label. I only see that there's one album on that, so this must have been theirs. Okay, you got it there? Now, is that the compendium or is that the actual? This is the, yeah, this is the compendium. It's okay. just got all the demos. It's the early demos and the EPs. And uh, if anybody's ever looking for this, Eisenwald still has copies of this. It's a fairly new pressing. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's it's literally just the first demo and right the original the 90, two EPs. The promo. Mm -hmm. Well, it's got the promo ninety eight on there, right? Yeah, that has hallways of uh, Janet Ebony, Ebony yeah. and Melancholy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. that's right. Mm -hmm. um, the only two tracks on here that are not on records are the wilderness and this old cabin i think everything else has ah. been, um everything else has been done on record or ep but okay yeah this old cabin was on the first demo and what, what's the other one called the wilderness that was on there as well right? the wilderness yeah yeah you know that's good stuff i mean it sounds raw to, and by raw i mean recording wise it's a little raw but again, it's got a very new wave of British heavy metal vibe to it, um, to my ears. 
But also, I mean, like it couldn't be even more overstated how much they were influenced by Oliver. If you look oh, at these pictures, big I mean, time, those man. pretty much just mirror the pictures in Berg you know? <laughs> Yeah, they do. Those are incredible yeah, pictures. I mean, I'm I'm really happy yeah. to be able to see those. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, never seen the... these until until this release, but I think there's they're in the Pacific there. Northwest, which you could almost maybe mistake yeah. for Norway if you were how about that? That's great. I've never seen this because I don't have this one, which we'll talk about a little bit down the road here. But that's cool, man. Yeah. Now, is that you said that's the Compendium, right? Yeah, it's called the. Uh, the no, this archive? is called. Um, this is called yeah, the Demonstration, Demonstration Archive. Archives. Demonstration Archive. That's um, it. Yeah, that was. But yeah, the like first I said, it's a fairly new. Um, Eisenwald just started pressing these, so you can still get it. If anybody wants it. Yeah, I mean, the whole, you know, just to quickly touch on that, you know, there's a big step up from the Promo 98 from uh, the original demo. And some of my notes here, uh, Hallways of Enchanted Ebony, super cool intro. Uh, that's a killer track. And I think they 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 redo that then on Pale Folklore then, I believe, correct? Yep. That, yep. That, and, it's, and it's a different version at that point. And same with Melancholy Spirit. Um, just to touch on... As Embers Dress the Sky, which is on Pale Folklore, then, you know, that, that track is, what's to say, very cool. Uh, I really like the mellow interludes. And you hear a little bit more of the the classical Sh Shane Breyer influences a lot more on these early demos than it is. Obviously, they they move on from that by the time they get to Pale Folklore and of, of Stone Wind. So, all right. Um, how about we move on to the first album then, guys? Ready to do that? Sounds good. Anybody, uh, you guys, Logan or Ryan, did you want to speak to the demos at all? Did, did you know them? Or are you familiar with them? Do you have I have the... not listened to them. I've legitimately, I've only listened to it once in my life. Um, okay. And since they've pretty much most of all of those songs appear on later records. In better versions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And okay. that's another, like they've remastered so many of their albums. I tend to listen to the, the better song because right. I feel like that's the one the band is most proud of i guess represented yeah, they want you to hear it <laughs> okay so uh pale folklore again they're assigned to the end records and pale folklore comes out june 6 1999 on the end records uh jimmy you have that one you want to show that one? do you have that on album or okay cd let's jump up there oh, you got he's, on album he's got too. Too. I, I figure you had to have them both yeah nice oh you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, this is the official original cover. Yep. I think that's the one I've got. And yep. This is yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, what pressing is that album? Then is that more recent, like two thousand six? This is actually or so? a, It's an end end records pressing. It's a little bit newer. Um, but yeah, this one um, is actually a picture disc. Um, oh. That I got. I actually have multiple pressings. Oh, that's pretty cool. Like. One of my favorite albums of all time, so I've got a ridiculous amount of these. But I, I just wanted to kind of show this one because this is the first one I bought. Uh, yep. You know, and, and the original and records. Uh, yep, you know, I got that one too. Yeah. You know, um, yep. And the, and the artwork's really cool on it. I really like it. It's almost it's almost understated. It's very austere, almost. You know what I mean? And um, all right, so how about we? Uh, Kicking with our thoughts on this album, we'll start. We'll just go around. We'll start with Logan, go to Ryan and Jimmy and I last. Then, all right, Logan, what you got on uh, this album? Cool. So, I'm gonna come out pretty strong right out Good. right out the gate. Uh, so, I also I bought that. Oh, nice. The, the end. Re oh, nice. I think this came out. I think this was like 20 uh, 2013. Yeah, I was gonna so, say 12 or 13. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, on gold. Uh. This well, first first Aglock album I heard, and that definitely makes it very impactful. And honestly, the first two albums are very personal for for different reasons. I'd say this one was more personal because of like the emotional themes and stuff that is displayed in the music. You know, themes or just a feeling, general feeling of isolation and loneliness but then at the same time like peace and calm and in, in nature and stuff uh that i really connected with and it straight up is my favorite agalock album and probably one of my favorite albums ever period nice you, know? you and it's, jimmy man yeah it's it's 
honestly, it's impossible to top. I mean, she painted fire across the skyline is an absolute masterpiece of an opener. I, like, I, it immediately clicked with me as soon as that, like, cold guitar melody just starts in the beginning with like the wind in the background and then just slowly yeah. builds up to the opening. And then like on top of the, uh, the black metal, you know, speed, there's these beautiful guitar melodies that honestly, it reminds me of in flames, like, like uh gesture race in flames or, or maybe Iron Maiden too. But uh, there's these just beautiful guitar lines that just arc, across the whole song and i love how they break it up into three parts and stuff and each part you know is perfect with each other but then also stands perfectly on its own uh and there's just so many killer moments on just that first song alone it's like and it's 18 minutes but they make it seem effortless you know and then uh hallways of enchanted ebony is the the next full song after misshapen steed which is a pretty emotive interlude track which agaloc always do great with interludes i think like yeah their interludes almost are like standalone songs that like if i just heard that by itself i would be perfectly content with it it's beautiful i, I, fucking I, call, beautiful. I call them uh bridging tracks they kind of bridge yes. the epics together and as we know uh john was pretty into the long songs pretty much mm -hmm. every album was a long you know there was yeah. at least four or five really long songs with uh bridging tracks between them yeah yeah and uh always enchanted ebony is also awesome um it might actually be well every single track on this album is perfect and i love every single one but like if i were to rank them it'd probably be at the bottom just just barely, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And then Dead Winter Days is just a super emotionally heavy track. Like, it's got verses and, like, or the chorus is about, I guess it sounds like a couple or, like, a, a romantic couple who, you know, committed suicide in different seasons of the year. Like, one, one time John sings, she killed herself in the spring, and the other time it's, like, he killed himself in the fall or something. I, it's... Yeah, and it definitely bleeds through the the music for sure. And then uh, you mentioned it earlier, as Embers Dress the Sky is my favorite Agalock song, like, period. Killer track, killer it's track. Just, and it opens up good. with just a phenomenal just intro. It just goes right, right out of the gate, 100 miles an hour, like, with just the beautiful melodies and stuff. And then you mentioned the acoustic interlude parts that slowly builds into this galloping riff that finalizes the song. And it's just, it's just amazing. Every single second of that song is perfect. And then Melancholy Spirit is up there as well. And I think it's their doomiest song on the album. It's like a kind of a slow burner in the beginning and the acoustic interplay might be the best on that song, you know? And it just, it builds beautifully and there's that one riff in like the chorus part which is just pure uh headbanging bliss i would say uh i think i think this album is extremely important for the u.s black male scene you guys mentioned briefly uh where they stood in 1999 among like their compatriots and stuff and how they were very distinct I think right. if you if you look at the Cascadian black metal scene that's kind of developed in America, where like being Americana is almost a main focus. You mentioned Wayfarer Jeff. I think yep. you'd throw Alda in there. I think you'd throw uh, Panopticon in there. Yes. Um, Falls of Raros. Falls of Raros. Yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff on Bind Rune, probably. I think it owes it a lot to this album right here. Um, oh. It's interesting you bring up Panopticon. I actually talked to Austin yesterday. I had a text uh, message mm -hmm. uh, thread with him, and he said that this band was extremely critical to the uh, formation of of Panopticon sound. He said, "I wear my influences one hundred percent on my sleeve, and I own them." And he knows that he knows the guys well. I'm, you know, I'm sure. Um, 
That's cool to hear, honestly. Definitely, definitely there. Um, yeah, that's some really good good stuff there, Logan. Really like that. Um, how about you, Ryan? Talk to me a little bit about this album. Got it, yeah. So I have a lot of similar comments to Logan. Um, this, I, I guess I'll be the downer here. This this record falls somewhere. I ranked everything just for fun. This one yeah, yeah. Somewhere in the I'm middle. I'm going to do it too. I like it a lot. It's a great record, obviously. And as I said, you know, they don't have bad releases. They're one of my favorite bands of all time. But this one falls somewhere in the middle for me. I still love it though, and I think it's an amazing introduction to the band, uh, as it you know, as it was for people in the late '90s, but also just as as a band fleshing out their sound and sort of figuring out what they wanted to do moving forward. Um, I think especially like, I think John really found his vocal style on this record. Um, right. It's pretty iconic, honestly. Like, it, it almost sounds. I don't know. I mean, I mean, that that vocal style wouldn't work for a lot of types of metal. Let me just say it that way. Like, sort of weak and almost whispery, and a lot of times right. people don't like that in metal. But it's just absolutely perfect for this band. It just it it really complements the music. Um, also, you know, they have a lot of orchestral elements. They have like big timpani parts, uh, piano stuff. They even have operatic like female vocals on a couple of these tracks. Um, yes, that I mean that's a, that's a lot. Like that's a lot to incorporate into a band's first release, first real you know label release. Um, so you know they're certainly not a band that that um, sort of pulls punches or, or doesn't go for exactly what they're trying to do. Um, just a couple, yeah, quick comments. Misshapen Steed, I think, is a great interlude track. Like as a band, they just really understand like how to make like they understand the pacing of a record really well. Um, they know when to throw an interlude. They know when to have big emotional climactic moments. Um, and then, yeah, As Embers Dress the Sky, probably my favorite song on the record um, as well. And it has that amazing, like, a discordant piano intro, and then they just throw you right into that first riff. Uh, it's so good. It's just really heavy. Um, I, I, yeah. I love a lot of these tracks, but um, taken as a whole, yeah, it's probably somewhere in the middle for me. I think one word that kind of always comes to mind when I'm thinking about uh, Agaloc is evocative. Absolutely. There's something about their music that's evocative of, R Logan brought it up, which I failed to mention, the, the Cascadian thing, whatever that is. Um, you know, you hear it in bands now like Uada a little bit, where they're not like Agaloc, but you hear that Cascadian black metal sort of sound. And they're evocative of mountaintops and cloudy, rainy environs and wood, you know, the, the, the woodsiness of everything. And it's really, that's what I hear when I listen to this. So, um, Jimmy, how about you? Cause I know you, you feel really strongly about this one. Yeah. Allow me to, uh, wax poetic for a few. <laughs> go, 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 go. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, I totally agree with everything Logan said and and Ryan. I mean, uh, you know, I think oftentimes I'm sure you guys would agree that like uh, when they're you know when when it comes to a band that you really love um, and you're asked what your favorite record is, you I guess you often feel, you know, like the first thing that you heard by the band is your favorite. Like for example, like the first time I ever heard Death was the Human record, and uh, and that's probably my favorite Death record. Um, you know, as I had kind of talked about, like I, I came into this band pretty, pretty early on when they first came out. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, because like, uh, you know, I was still living in New Orleans and, and in a place that had nothing really in common with what uh, what this album was sort of portraying to me, which I think was that much more attractive um, in what it was doing. I mean, when I first uh, listened to it, you know, in probably 2000, um, it was a really new thing for me because I wasn't into any black metal. I wasn't into, well, you know, say for maybe like Dimu Borger and, um, you know, kind of more easier mainstream kind of stuff, if you want to call it that. Um, but um, at first I, I didn't like the vocals at all. Like I, 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 I put it on and I listened and it instantly like, uh, you know, drew me in with, with, with the, the nature sound and the wind. And, um, you know, I listened to a bit of it and I knew that I, I was onto something here. I was like, there's something really amazing going on here that I'm really, really attracted to. And uh, I'm not sure what it is. And it took a long time um, for me to really come around to the entirety of the record, um, especially with the vocals. I mean, I, there was a time where, you know, when I first started listening to it, 
I was like, I had a burned copy of it before I even bought the CD. And I, I would like fast forward through sections the of the songs sections. just listen to like the, the parts that I really liked, which was like, <laughs> you know, like the interludes and like the, you know, the, the real atmospheric parts. And then when it would get to like the big, you know, heavy parts, like I would just like, it, it hadn't quite clicked yet for me. Right. <clears throat> and um, really didn't like the vocals at first. I just, I don't know if I really at the time was ready and you know i didn't really like the raspy kind of black metal vocal i think it took yeah you know, i think this was the record that kind of changed that for me um and over time i eventually come to love love the vocals very very much um it just you know again we're talking i mean when this first came out 2000 i'm in my early 20s i'm you know i was kind of late to the game to like you know the sort of stuff and <clears throat> I mean, I would just like the first track, like the first part of uh, She Painted Fire Across the Skyline, I would like fast forward, yeah, like even the the, the female vocals like kind of creeped me out. I almost couldn't like listen to it. Um, <laughs> now I realized the importance of them, you know, in the song. I would like fast forward to the end of the song where it goes into the part where they've kind of got past the female vocals and there's the timpani, boom, boom. Yeah, and, and yeah. The guitar and the wind is blowing. And I remember thinking like I could see like, you know, living in, in Louisiana, I could see the mountains and and, and, and and I felt the pull to that. And uh, and, uh, it, you know, it go from from that to the second part of the song with the acoustic part. Nah, 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 and I just like, oh, God, I mean, it just gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. I mean, this this is a record that I could still listen to today and I still get goosebumps when I when I hear like like, like the parts. There's not a record. Like, there's not a lot of records that I can say that about. I don't think anybody can say that you can listen to it so many times and it still uh, draws goose flesh and just gives you the, you know, the hair on the end of your, your back stands up and it just, I mean, it has that sort of effect. And uh, I, I largely credit this album with my, <clears throat> my eventual, uh, you know, move uh, to Colorado and my eventual, um, you know, you know, finding my yearning for, for wilderness and, uh, and nature and, and getting away from the concrete and away from the rat race and getting into a place that was unspoiled and, um, and, and just, uh, you know, as it is in nature. And, you know, to me, that's, that's very important. If you watch my channel, you know, you know that I'm into those things is hiking and things like that. So uh, this is the very album that, that really kind of, I found sort of a, um, you know, found sort of a personality for myself, um, you know, in being in my twenties and trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted out of life, um, I think this album uh, helped me along that path um, because I really could see that and feel. Agalock, I, of, I often would, would, would describe as a band that you feel, you know, it's you feel the music <clears throat> as opposed to like so much metal that you might listen to. It's more of like a listening thing and kind of a, you know, headbanging kind of thing or whatever it is, just rocking out. Like this is stuff that you really like feel in your heart and your soul um, that, that, that digs deep, deep into the human spirit and, and pulls out, you know, I'm not really, I wouldn't say like I'm an alienated person, but I, I, you know, but I am in a way like felt that sort of like pull away from, from, you know, that feeling of modern society or whatever you want to call it. Um, right. In talking about the music, I mean, everything, everybody said, I agree with them. Um, um, Jimmy, I, if I could interrupt for one sec. Um, mm -hmm. Another word that comes up with this band for me is meditative. Do you find that? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, very much so. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the picture of Hom there looking out the window. I mean, I remember when I first saw that, I was like, man, I mean, in this artwork, and that's a wonderful thing about Agalock is, you know, like it's all one, one, you know, it's the music, but it's also the imagery and like those, all those things lock in together. Perfect. Very concept, perfectly. very conceptual. Very, very much so, and, and and it also like lends to to the to the music because the music has sort of a cinematic quality to it. You there know, you that go. You, That's you it. You can see like you can see the music and, and and not just hear it. You can you can see these forests and you know this desolate kind of wasteland kind of stuff. And uh, uh, so I uh, yeah man I, I I would agree with you Jeff. And, and and as far as the record goes, and far as the music, I mean I I, I couldn't think of a. You know, obviously, I'm 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 biased because it was the first record that I heard, and it absolutely is my favorite. And this is a, I would say, like Logan, I would agree, this is probably a top five of all time record uh, for me. Wow. And uh, you know, like it just it just flows like so perfectly. And uh, in terms, one of the things I love in terms of the, the the musicality of it is is 
they 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 found a guitar tone on here that I don't think has ever been replicated. Like just really guitar, really like, cool. Just like in the acoustic and the electric guitar, there's a there's a there's a there's a uh, would you call it sustenation? I don't know if that's a word. Well, a, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I hear. I definitely hear where I, John was influenced from '80s music because there's a a his clean tone on this album in particular, the clean tones are very reminiscent of early '80s bands and the kind of I think you're looking for sustain, but there's all he uses a lot of compression which make he compresses the notes which make them the attack very uh intense like that these things ring out there's ringing notes there's a lot of pedal tones in this where he's using like one note off another note and he's you he's changing around that melody note uh, the melody lines um and and so yeah I, I would definitely say um that's the probably the most unique thing about this plus i also think that his vocals are highly unique because he's not going for the shrieking banshee of Birdsome or the, the the craziness of say Attila or the the croaking of Abbott or something like that. It's a very Ryan mentioned it. It's very much like a whisper, and it becomes yeah. part of the fabric of the music, which is kind of different than a lot of the other. Uh, black metal bands of that time. Yeah, it's very subdued and, and 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 it was a good intro for me to like get into more of the black metal vocal, you know. And I think I think his his clean vocals like, you know, th there's like a I like to call it like a monk like quality to it, like like they're like a chanting kind of quality that I think really works well. Um, right. you know, because you know, Hom's got that sort of nasally kind of sound of voice, but um but that guitar tone, man. I mean, I think they sort of replicated it a little bit in ashes but i mean like god i just never heard anything that just what a guitar tune that like really just just i mean talks you in. Heartstrings and how amazing it is when they get into some of those yeah. acoustic sections and everything and it's just a very like uh you know like it's it's not a happy album it's you know it's very desolate it's dark but it's beautiful and it's uh you know Me melancholy there's a melancholy, lot of melancholy you know in the melancholy spirit i think for me is like you know the last track is really kind of encapsulates all the feeling that I have about this album and, and uh, really just, there's no band that can make like the samples, you know, like, you know, oftentimes when bands use samples or sounds like they use the wind in here and a lot of bands have used wind since then and all these things, but it's, it's so effective. So like uh, just let, I mean, just, I mean, propels the music so much more you know when you hear the wolves like howling at the end of dead winter days or whatever yeah you know, oh that's awesome you know, i mean god yeah. that shit just like gives me chills at my bones still to this day and i've heard this song like a thousand times and it still does it you know and it's just there's something to be said about that and that's a quality that uh you know like i'm always looking for in in black metal and in music and I'm, and it's hard to find you know and uh i i could talk about i could spend four hours talking about the sound guys so i don't want to hijack this but i mean you know so influential and so important to my very soul this this record is and wow you know I mean, you just can't um awesome man Dude, yeah. jimmy that was all well said man that was yeah thank you man which just uh what, what was your favorite out uh, song off the album out of curiosity probably no card spirit i mean it's yeah. so hard to pick a favorite because i think everything is just so perfect on this record even even and and one thing i know jeff is going to say is the drumming is not that good yeah. it's not perfect but i like that Which, because it's not perfect it's it's you know but i i would say um probably the melancholy spirit because yeah. that's just man it's it's that one really just god it just gets in you you know uh i don't know i didn't realize it's hom on drums during yeah, the first i did not realize that until doing like the research i just assumed it was the dude who was on uh ashes against the grain but it makes so much more sense listening to the drum performance and realizing it's hum because it's the drumming is meant to complement the guitar and it complements the music so well. It it doesn't overdo it or anything. It it all just accents what like the guitar or what the song needs. So I, I think it's it's not technically very good, but I think it's perfect for what the music requires. Here's where I'm gonna stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> uh. I I find the one thing about the album that drags it down for me a bit is the drumming. And I even Jimmy and I had a back and forth about this 
earlier. And I get what you guys are saying. Um, keep in mind that I'm coming back at this now after not listening to these albums for probably 15 years. So I, I think that there's, there's elements of this album that are just incredible. The, the guitar tones, the, especially the clean guitar tones and the acoustic, as Jimmy said, the interweaving of these parts where I do think he does have some issues with transitions on this album. I think he cleans them up as he goes further into the band's career. I don't think they're anything really glaring or intense. I didn't note anything. It was like, oh, that transition's awful or anything. But I do think they're, I noticed them more, not they, to me, they were notable because of the drumming, because there seemed to be tempo changes sometimes that seemed to be sort of vacillating a little bit. That could just be me being hypercritical. I don't know. Because, um, you know, you listen to those first three uh, Oliver albums and they have similar issues as well. Um, but man, the clean guitar tones on here and, and unlike you, Jimmy, I really gravitated to John's vocals because they were kind of unique for black metal. They just had this etherealness, this otherworldly sort of vibe to them, um, you know, where it was uh, very much a whisper. And then he would come in with that, that clean tone. I really like his clean tone. I, I wouldn't, he sounds like nobody else. And I don't really hear a nasal sound. I hear sort of a, I hear like joy division and that sort of almost like deadpan, like it's almost like a dry sort of chant. Like you said, it, his yeah. clean vocals have that going on with them. If I can jump um, in really quick. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, exactly how deaf and june sings yes yes and, they do and, like, it, it is a direct influence from like deaf and june and like current 93 and like first current wave. 93 exactly yes. yep edward cospell those guys i mean that there's very it's almost like i don't want to call it monotone because it's not monotone but it has it has elements of a monotone you don't get you don't get histrionics john's not a histrionic clean singer he's not doing the uh, 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 he doesn't do that. It's all very singular notes that lead up to. But I will say, for a guy, at, and I don't know how old John is. He's got to be, he's probably younger than me. He's probably in your age range, Jimmy, maybe like later 40s, perhaps, mid to late 40s. To be writing these epic length tracks with all these interweaving sections is, and he was primarily, I believe, the primary writer at first. I guess Don got more involved. I think the band became more involved as they went along. But John always was kind of the focal point of writing for this band. Um, let's see if I can get a couple of my quick notes here. She Painted Fire Across the Sky, that part one. Great epic opening that sets the template for their sound going forward. I really dig the operatic vocals. They are they do come out of left field, though. They're kind of jarring at first when you hear them. You got you to gotta adjust your ears a second and go, oh, okay, that's cool. That's unique. Has a little bit of a gothy feel. We didn't bring that word up before, but there's definitely a gothic feel to a lot of this. When I say For Americana sure. and goth, it's in there, man. It's not typo gothic, but yet it's not necessarily not there, too. You know, I mean, you, there's another guy, Pete Steele, who sang in that sort of almost monotone a lot of the time until he let loose with, the, I know you're fucking. Okay, anyways. I digress a little bit there, but I mean, when Pete would do his, you know, you know, something like a oh, wolf moon, da, 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 it kind of has a little bit of that kind of vibe to it. If, if you, maybe you guys hear it, maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, no, I do. Definitely. Miss Ape and Steed. Really cool, man. That's a, that's a Sean, a Shane Breyer track. I am assuming. It's it just is. got this beautiful ambient interweaving with the piano melodies. They're gorgeous. Um, the vocal section on uh, She Painted 3 section, um, it's kind of odd and jar jarring transition at first, but then it kind of comes together at the end and kind of ties together nicely. For me, As Embers Dress the Sky is probably the standout track. It's just such a evocative track. It has... It has this cinematic feel. That's a great way to put it. We're going to say that word over and over, you know. You know how it is in metal. You always say the same ten fucking words to describe albums, you know. Mm -hmm. Epic, killer, it's a crushing, slap. you know. Crushing. Yeah, 
yeah. crushing, brutal, ambient, brutal, lovely, you know, melancholy. But <laughs> lovely. it's it's true, you know. Uh, Enchanted uh, Hall- Hallways of Enchanted Amity. Um, really, that's another killer track. It has an '80s sort of vibe to it in the intro, um, and the melancholy spirit. Really solid ending to the album. Um, again, my only criticism of the album is the drumming. You guys like it a little more than I do. I, I'm, I'm, fa- I'm finding fault with a couple sections of it, and that's just simply because this album, probably like you, Ryan, falls a little further down the. It's probably third favorite for me of all their stuff. It's probably number three. Um, if I was giving it a number rating, I'd probably give it a seven and a half out of five. And most of that criticism is based on the drumming tempo unevenness, I would put it. But man, there what a way to come out of the gate. You know, it's but it only gets stronger from here, in my opinion. Totally. Um, any final thoughts on uh, Pale Folklore? I'll just yeah. say about the drumming real quick. It's funny how like toward the end of the album, like there's some parts where he's doing the, the hi hat thing, and he mm-hmm. totally like misses the upbeat on the hi hat. Like and it's exactly. Just, like, I feel like he was like really just like sick of of trying to play the shit in the studio. It was like fuck it. it take, yeah, let it know. go, I, dude. You nailed it, man. There was a couple of instances where I was like, okay, that he just exactly like he just left that go because it was like you know that's pre-digital stuff there that's probably 99 you're not really talking i don't think you're talking pro tools and logic yet at that point are we but that's probably a little bit later so they're probably cutting most of that live i mean yeah they can overdub but yeah i agree and and again i don't want to shit on it entirely he's a solid drummer he's just not a great drummer he's a much better guitar player singer I mean, piano, that guy, he's much better at that stuff. So, you can say um, he's more Ryan, basic, you, you know, right? Sorry, Ryan, yeah. did you have a thought on that? On Pale yeah, Folk yeah, I mean, I, I'm the only one who didn't mention the drums, uh, so I'll just weigh in. Um, I it didn't literally didn't even occur to me to to like listen intensely to the drums because I'm not a drummer, I don't have an ear for it, and right, I, like in all of my own projects, when I program drums, they just complement the riffs, like because that's that's how just, that's just how my brain works. So like I probably do a lot of the same stuff that Hom does that that maybe makes him a less accomplished drummer, but in in a way it 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 works perfectly for me just because that's also how I write and I guess engage with music. Yeah. Well, oh, so okay, so Jimmy's a drummer and and you are as well, right? Oh, I'm not a drummer. I've never played drums in my life. Okay. I've tried. You play, gu- you play guitar, right? I play guitar and I okay, program I drums in my. Okay. Band. Are you program? So, okay. Yeah. Well, we have CJ. We have CJ in the comments here. I think he's still here, and uh, I don't know. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but uh, CJ blows my mind. He's a fucking really, really good drummer for Amazing. A, as young a guy as he is, because he's he's a youngster even compared to Logan. <laughs> CJ, uh, I'd love to hear your take on the drums on Pale Folklore. I'd love to see your comment about that. We'll highlight that. Um, but that's also Logan's- a shameless plug for Ryan's band, Caltus Blue. Hmm? Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. EPL probably, probably this camp. month. I'll put oh, nice. in the chat. So <laughs> yeah, put that in the chat for sure. Absolutely, man. Um, we actually had 16 people on at one time. I'm that. Oh, that's shit. pretty cool. That's kind of surprising, seeing as how we're going up against Marty with Chromie D on the night. That's that's a tough task to to go against. So I'm really happy a lot of you guys are with us here on this. Um, Logan, final thoughts on? I I wanted to add in on. Folklore? on the drumming real quick that I, I think as we move in on through their discography, Agalock and drumming is a very uh, important issue that I will address as we get to the future albums for sure. But I think that Ryan, you probably hit it on the head that he was just writing the drums for the, the guitar that he wanted to create. And right. I, I would never consider myself a drummer, but I, I played for, you know, a little bit, and I would play along to Agalock's Pale Folklore because the drums are simple enough to play, and they're they're fun. I think they're, you know, very fun to play along with just because of how simple, and you're just basically accenting everything that happens in the music, you know? 
And if you know the yeah. music well, you can play the drums perfectly fine yeah. too. Yeah, again, it's the music. they're they're serviceable drums. They're nothing super mm -hmm. uh, extraordinary. You know, they're not they're not fucking trim or who else could we say from that era? I mean, um, you know, who uh, who who Frost, played for Enslave I mean, on those? Dirge yeah, who played on? You know, Dirge Rap or Dirge Rap. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think they, they intended the drums to be at the forefront. You know, I think they were supposed to serve the songs, and I think there's moments where they do. There's moments where it's obviously, you know, sort of the, uh, I like to call it the unreliable drummer, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, the percussion is important for Agalock, you know, especially <coughs> when it comes to, like, using interesting sounds like timpanis and... and uh, yes. Glockenspiels or bells or whatever the hell they do, you know, it's you know, it's kind of a more percussion than a drum set feeling to it, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's move on to the first EP, uh, which is called "Of Stone Wind." Uh, I'm sorry, "Stone Wind Pillar," right? End pillar, right? Yeah. Okay, let's pull that one up there. Oh, nice man! Is that is that a fairly uh, recent? Yeah, this is a new, uh, so anybody like, uh, man, this was like unavailable for the longest time, but Eisenwall just did a recent uh, pressing of this um, uh, on a few different color variants, which is pretty cool. I don't know if you have this, Logan, but um, yeah, kind of a cool. Oh, wow. No, Look at I, that. That's cool. Yeah, that they really awesome. did justice to the CP and rightfully so because it really needed it. Um, but yeah, there we go. Nice. Um, so this came out on. Uh, Again, on the end records, produced by Ron Chick, who produced the first one, uh, who also played since, by the way. Um, this came out May 28, 2001, and it uh, originally planned to be released as a 7-inch with three tracks on Iron Fist Productions, but that never happened, so the end ended up putting it out. Um, how about we... Uh, Start with you again, there, young fella. Hit me up. Oh, hey. So, uh, preparing for the stream was my first time listening to this EP. Wow. So, yeah, uh, their EPs outside of uh, Faustian were one were just releases that I never really visited. I guess because they were released before, and they're kind of harder to come by before the recent uh, reissue of Reissues, yeah. this one, in particular, which. Honestly, after tonight's stream, I'm going to go on, uh, what did you say it was, Eisenwald? Eisenwald, Eisenwald yeah. I'm going to pick up this one and then probably Faustian as well. Uh, but I, I think this this EP perfectly captures kind of the transition between Pale Folklore and where they're going to. It's definitely, uh, and this might just me be me because I'm able to, you know, use the rear view and look back on both albums in between, but it just sounds like it's the bridge, if you will. Uh, the title track that opens it up, it sounds like a in-between of the melancholy spirit and uh, the opening shadow in our a pale companion off of uh, the mantle, like it's kind of yeah. slower, heavier riffs, uh, focus on just that slow crawl kind of build of a song. The the riff in it is, is awesome. I definitely love that. Uh, and then the also chugging riff? the, the chugging, chugging riff. riff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. the, there's more of a focus on interlude tracks, which become a major. What well, and you wouldn't, wouldn't call them interludes. What, what did you call it, Jeff? The well, I call them transitions, but they're instrumentals. So I mean, instrumentals. Yeah, right. But they they help. So they're instrumentals, but they don't stand alone. They help one flow into bridge the other in, bridge into the next track and there. they use they use that be beautifully in the mantle which we will i'm sure yeah we'll touch on shortly but they bring in two in this album and or this ep that are also awesome uh i will admit when i heard uh to the what kneel to the cross that chant the first time i heard that uh, summer has come again, arise, arise, that chant. I yep. thought I was listening to a different band. I was like, what the what the fuck is Insafirum doing on my uh, Agaloc, That's... you know, Spotify? Like, it, it kind of threw me off, and I did not like it the first time I heard it. But 
subsequent listens, I kind of, I'm, I'm cool with it. And also that song, it's, I mean, uh, it's the great cold death of the earth, right? Just reworked or, I mean, it's the same song, isn't it? Like the backdrop of it and the flow. We're talking about, we're talking about a poem by Yeats. No, Neil at the sign, uh, the Neil at the Cross. Neil at the Cross. That's it's... that's no, that's a Soul Invictus cover. That's a cover song. Oh, well, yeah. it, it sounds very similar to "In the Great Cold Death of the Earth." Like certain parts of it do. Yeah, that one's so, a, that one's a that one's a cover. Um, I did not realize that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anything about Soul Invictus. I'm not going to lie; I never never checked them out before, so I don't know anything about that. But and. I love that then, man, the beginning of that. Da, 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 yeah. Da, arise, arise. And I, it grew on me very, oh, yeah. uh, very quickly for sure. The first time was jarring, but the second, third, I was all in. Digging. Um, and then the poem by Yeats. I want to dive deeper into like what specifically that's about, and I'm sure you guys can tell me more. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, Yeats is a uh, poet, poet, right? Yeah. Like, I didn't, like, dive into what specific poem and stuff, you know? No, uh, so not. I'd, I'd be curious to hear about it shortly. I want to say it, it ends with just silence, or at least on I was listening to it on Spotify, with silence. In it, but then if you keep listening, uh, yeah. Butthead comes in. Yeah, yeah. Some Butthead and says, yeah. man, this band sucks, or something like that. Funny. Uh, the poem is called The Sorrow of Love. Yes. And that, that's all I got on that, by the way. Taking the piss, as they say. Uh -huh. Um, Ryan, what you got on, uh, this EP, this first EP? So, uh, some solid comments from Logan there. Um, I, what I wrote down is this EP feels like Agalock insisting that they're more than a metal band. Yeah. Uh, you have a lot, a lot of different influences, traditional folk, neo folk. Um, I don't care what anyone says, uh, fully, uh, fully orum viridium, I think is what it's called is that's a dungeon synth song. Like, yeah, it is. That's, like a, that's yep. like a Mortis song, um, which is awesome. I think it's cool. I think this EP is a little strange because it kind of feels like a, a compilation of tracks more than like a distinct release. Um, yeah. But it's fine. I love it. I love all these songs individually. Uh, poem by Yates is great. Um, that poem is called The Sorrow of Love. Um, I minored in poetry in college, so it was really oh, nice. Cool. Really cool to see like a metal band like you know and his his lyrics are very poetic like he puts a lot of thought into his, his lyrics sure. but it's cool to see like some nods to the to the master poets um, i'm assuming yeats is uh an english poet he's irish yeah. um, irish okay yeah so i yeah a lot of love for him um neil to the cross really cool song um that is a soul invictus cover soul invictus is another neo folk band uh same era as death and june so it, i mean it's clear how influenced they were by that and and metal um and then i guess the only other comment i have is the chant at the beginning of that soul invictus song is in the original mm -hmm. but it is also a, that's what they chant at the end of the wicker man yeah and mm. in and on the white ep they use multiple samples lots from of samples yep. yeah so i also love how much because wicker man is that's a top four top three movie for me one of my Great favorites movie. ever Great such movie. a big influence on Aglock too. So it's just like yeah. really cool to see how how much our interests overlap. Um almost feels like the band was just tailor made for me sometimes. But yeah, I love that. <laughs> you and, and, you I, and I Jimmy and Logan specifically, I believe. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Like it, but that's that's they're so I don't know, they're such a like profound band that everybody feels like the band is made for them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. They yeah. just have something for everyone, I feel like. But like yeah, like John it. like John's writing these songs specifically just for you. Oh yeah, he had me in mind specifically. <laughs> I was I was five years old when this came out. I was gonna say, even though you were just an infant, probably yeah, yeah. right. Um, but that's it. Yeah, I I love the CP. It's 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 kind of <laughs> random and hodgepodge, but it's still really good. I agree with you that there is a bit of eclecticism with this. It's not like one uniform statement, so to speak, um, like their albums tend to be. But uh, I have some thoughts there, Jimmy. What you got, man? Yeah, um, I think. Um, I, I think, like, to me, this is kind of a companion piece to Pale Folklore. And I think that um, a lot of this stuff was kind of left over. <clears throat> I don't want to say left over, but kind of definitely in the time frame of the record. I do know that um, the title track of uh, Stone, Wind, and Pillar 
was actually intended to be on folk, uh, Pell Folklore, but uh, they, they decided uh, to not include it because they were going to have a certain amount of songs and Dead Winter Days uh, took precedence um, over it. So, I mean, and then the rest of it, I think uh, it was just kind of things that they probably would. I agree with like Logan that like you're kind of seeing like how they're going to, you know, go forward to the next record. But at the same time, I think like it, it just it's an extension of Pale Folklore in that it's showing you the diversity of this band and the diversity of what they are capable of. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, I loathe is to say that this is the last uh, contributions of uh, Shane Breyer. Shane Breyer, right. Unfortunately, because I think that... Um, <clears throat> Florium, uh, Viridium, and uh, the Poem of Yeats both are really his last. Well, I don't even know if Poem of Yeats, but really the Florium song was really his last contribution. But what a perfect, beautiful. Uh, it is oh, kind of like a, a precursor to like sort of like Dungeon Synth. And I don't think yeah. any Dungeon Synth band has really quite done it as well as that. But, um, you know, yeah, I don't know. Was was Mortis around at this point in time? Oh, I guess no, he probably yeah, he was. was. Oh, yeah, yeah. He probably already released his first couple. Of right. Years, probably. You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to go too, I mean, it, for me, it, it fits right in with Pale Folklore as much as, uh, as far as what I love about it. Um, it's wonderful to me, uh, every single track. It, it, I think it's just hod, hodgepodge for a reason because it was kind of not intended to be um, sort of like uh, a, a single finish. statement. You yeah, know, because when it comes statement. to Agalock, a lot of their stuff, it, do, it does feel like it's intended to be start to finish, like everything is intentional. Whereas right. this is, you know, the things that they had that they were they were working on, um, uh, the Soul Invictus cover, for example, that was, you know, them showing their influences. And Soul Invictus is a, you know, a neo folk uh, band that's kind of interesting because, like anybody in metal, probably never even heard any neo folk until they heard this, and uh, <clears throat> they would do that one live often, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't want to go too far far on it. I love it. I think it's uh, t for me, it's just. Uh, an extension of pale folklore it's a, it's an essential agalock release no doubt well when did uh in natin's madrigal come out do you remember was that 97 96 yeah. i mean yeah that was already out by then so it was out yeah so that was kind of the template for that sort of um neo folky sort of thing um uh, right. but you're right there wasn't a lot especially in the United States. I don't think it was pretty much anybody that was doing what John was doing here. Um, yeah, for me, I, I like this. It's pretty cool. Um, the vocals on of stone wind and pillar, man, they're snarling on that track. He's just like vicious. Um, the vocals really stick out to me. Um, let's see what else. Oh, it's got that heavy chugging. That's probably my favorite track on the album. I do like the cover. Uh, I, I like that, but I get where you're coming from, Logan. If you weren't expecting it, probably was like, whoa, what's jarring a little the bit? The first listen, yeah. Sure. Yeah, Foley and Viridium, beautiful, beautiful track. Just beautiful. Um, it, it's a shame that he left when he did. I would have liked to have heard maybe some further contributions from him going forward, but, uh, you know, was not to be. Um, the uh, Haunting Birds is a weird one, man. I like that track a lot. Cause it gets, it starts acoustically and it moves into this and it gets crushingly heavy. But again, one major problem sticks out. It's the drumming. It just has this weird unevenness that makes me go, Ugh. I feel seasick a little bit listening to it. And uh, Sylvan says the nest cover of haunted birds is better. I'll have to check that. Out. I never, I never checked that one out. And that's the thing. I mean, I really like that track, but the drumming just, it, it agitates me a little bit. Um, I really do like Neil to the cross, like the not only the beginning of that, but the the the, the verse or the chorus rather, I would say, is really really hypnotic. It's kind of entrancing when you listen to it. Um, the last one, a poem by Yeats. What's really sticks out to me, and I haven't none of you guys mentioned this. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. But man, that sounds like a dead can dance track, and that absolutely was an influence on John. Had to be hands down. He had to have listened to a lot of That's dead awesome. Can Dance. I, yeah, I had never thought of that explicitly, but that I totally it, it listen to that song, it was like boom, and I'm a massive Dead Can Dance fan. And it was like, you know, okay, take Lisa out of the the picture. But Bre even even his vocals are a little Brendan Fraserish in a weird way. Brendan has that 
very mon it's not monotone it's a beautiful voice but it's very saccharine and it's very uh it's very resonant has a very resonant voice and that's what john has a resonant voice when he does his cleans so logan if you don't know dead can dance you got you got your work cut out for you i i do i do not i do not know them or i, you, I mean i know of them but i do not own any of their stuff so you need to know about them Realms of a Dying Sun in particular is where I would start because it's a Realms fucking a epic sun. album. Oh my god, so good, so good. Um, shorter songs on here, which is kind of interesting because that doesn't happen on the next two or three albums. Um, there are some awkward shifts in tempo again, especially in Haunting Birds, like I said, where it sounds like over dubs weren't used oh jimmy this goes back to what you said i noted on this album it says uh especially uh yeah yeah come on where am i saying here awkward shifts in some of the guitar especially in haunting birds where it sounds like overdubs weren't used um yeah so again this is a good one i'd give this i'd give this a seven and a half out of ten um they did the marks do get better i promise uh right now in fact let's talk about the mantle are we ready to move on guys let's do it yeah let's i wish i wasn't old and didn't have to read notes but i'm old and i have to read notes because i can't remember shit anymore the mantle comes out on the end records on 8 13 2002 um production again by ron chick and john holm ron also plays some synths some mandolin and contributes some samples um oh this also includes several outside musicians i did not write them oh. all down we'll look at jimmy's cool looking what, album what pressing is that is that an og there no i think uh no it's not it's uh this is a growl uh g-r-a-u growl pressing um and actually unfortunately uh john hom uh despises this this pressing he says it's not an official pressing oh i bought it when i first started collecting vinyl because i had to have this on vinyl but um yeah i mean it sounds wonderful to me so apparently it was not endorsed by the band when they they released it but um uh you can see growl growl um records here yeah is that a is that a gatefold or just a yeah it's a gatefold double lp uh pick a double yeah, clear vinyl i mean uh it sounds what wonderful. years what year is that one I don't think it has. A, I mean, yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I bought this in like 2013, maybe. I mean, uh, it was before it was before the end did all the new pressings of it. So yes. it's not I don't know if the end had I, I mean, I'm sure there's an original pressing for the end. But I mean, Growl, I think Growl is a like a European label. And again, uh, Hom said that they did not have the rights to press this. So he considers it an unofficial pressing. But to me, okay. it's uh, Fine. I don't know if they had the original masters for it and they still did it, but I don't know, but sounds fine to me. So, so, um, you know, this is where I came in. You know, this is the first album that I bought from them CD and, um, I have a lot to say about it, but we're going to stay with our, our, uh, brand. Uh. I'm sorry about my finger coming into the picture. I really don't have any other alternative, but to, uh, blow you guys up that way. So sorry to those watching out in the chat there. Go ahead, do what you gotta do. Logan. So I got I have the end pressing from oh, nice. 20, 2015, I think. Oh, that's so cool. different. Yeah. Different, different album cover. cover different oh, album man, cover. That's badass. And I I don't know if it's the same gear from a different angle. I did not do that much research, but it is. I think it, it is, is yeah. cool. Yeah. That's currently that's awesome. That's awesome. Looks like gear. it's a head on shot Which, as opposed from down below and looking up. Yeah. Are all of the other like shots? You from like a similar area because it's it's they yeah, are it's a part. I, I mentioned a, it in my in my notes, but it's like a very specific. It's important that that deer was used as it's the a album park, cover. isn't it, guys? It's a park. Yes, it's in Portland. Portland. I'll yeah. Show you. yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, I have too many notes it, to, to find a specific one, but as, as I was it. saying earlier, uh, the first two albums, Pale Folklore and this one, The Mantle, very personal for me. Some of like the most you know, important music. Uh, see you, Peter. Ever. To Say me. goodbye to Peter, uh, everybody. See you, Bye, Peter. Thanks for Peter's hanging out. Name. He's um. Just to interject real quick, Peter says it's two thirty a.m. There, he's like six hours or five hours ahead of us. So, 
uh, real trooper hanging in there with us tonight, man. Go ahead. Bogan. Could. Yep. So yeah, uh, pale folklore was more of like, like important, like emotionally where like I, I, uh, attached myself to the emotions and just the overall feeling of the album. This one is important to me because of the, the message that is kind of conveyed in the music and specifically in the lyrics and almost like the layout. And it, it kind of starts right off the bat when you start opening up the, uh, the pressing that message right there. The happiest, the happiest man is man he is who learns from nature, the lesson of worship. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yeah. 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 And I don't know, that kind of just sums up this album and really probably Hom's mission statement perfectly you know like he yeah i think just despised just society and what like you know it was becoming and the materialistic and nature of it and there was no there was no god for him and i think religion is definitely brought up here specifically in the first uh the first song um celebration from the for the death of man no, uh, in the shadow, because that's just the, oh, in the uh, shadows. Oh, that's, that's just the intro. intro, right? Right. Yeah. The shadows in, of our pale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the shadows of our pale companion. Uh, who who would the pale companion be? Death, perhaps. That's how that's how I understand it. Yeah. Yes, because death is where he ends up at the end of that song. I believe. Right. I believe it, it, it insinuates that he commits suicide at the at the end of it. But he's looking for like a religious uh, answer for life essentially i think and there's just some great lyrics great lyrics here like uh let's see where i i have to organize my notes a little bit better next time for sure uh <laughs> shit. rick just pointed out that when your head's down you're looking at that the antlers in the background it looks like oh, you have right antlers here. above your head <laughs> That's funny. I'll Rick would notice. Rick would notice that. You find him? Uh, no. But this is so. The other. I'll just keep going on. Uh, okay. So to me, this is Agalock. Just kind of becoming themselves. Like you'd say that Agalock was a black metal band on Pale Folklore, but this one, they fully embrace that Godspeed you, that you guys oh, were talking yeah. about earlier, and yep. they are just almost a post-rock band that's sprouted black metal influences and stuff like yep. uh tracks like the instrumental um shoot the hawthorne passage which beautiful by the way uh and then jeff how do you feel about the the drums on uh i am the wooden doors real quick because uh, it's it's the most black metal it's okay like harkening you. back to here's my uh, note pale folklore here's my note solid track the drumming seems off for some reason <laughs> yes uh, on the double bass you can tell yeah, i kind of like on the it. Double it, just makes yeah. it it just makes it feel it, it feels not sloppy just off i don't know how to put it other than that it just feels off that's the one track you asked me about and that's the one track i note the drumming on yeah the rest the rest i don't have any other issues with for the most part so i i, I finally found the the lyrics i was kind of looking for cool so go for on, it. in the shadow of our pale companion he says if this uh he's here i gaze at a pantheon of oak a citadel of stone if this grand panorama before me is what you call god then God is not dead. But ah, I was going to bring up, yeah, I was going to bring up that exact line. That, that's that's just a that has always stuck with me, and I think the delivery of that line it's in that his whispered, his harsh whisper, if you will. Uh, well, if I might interject a quick yeah. thing on uh, the white EP, there's a song called Pantheist. A Pantheist is it, Jimmy, or Pantheism? Pantheist. Pantheist, and. That summarizes that line you just said. Summarizes pantheism right there. God is in mm -hmm. everything that you see, yeah. feel. It, it, God is everything. It is not this mythical old man sitting on a throne up in 
heaven somewhere or Jesus Christ or something like that. So that was the God that John was worshiping yes, nature. I, I took it to mean it's like what you interpret that's essentially not made by man. You right. Know? And the idea of like the spiritual God is almost more made by man than anything that is out in nature. And I, it was just cool to see that perfectly represented in in that song and then the the, the interludes here are just yep. perfect or the instrumental tracks because they're not interludes like odal that's a straight oh. up post rock post metal absolutely banger of a song it gets super heavy and the guitar melodies that just echo through that are just gorgeous gorgeous um, beautiful i mean just spine chillingly beautiful i am the wooden doors i think is just great it's the perfect like kind of harsh uh contrast to in the shadow of our pale companion you know with the double bass and the more black metal influence and uh i like one more lyrical line i like when he's just screams and like pierces through the music he screams i wish to die with my will and spirit intact ah just sticks with you mm -hmm. and then the lodge i have to Mention the uh, the deer antler as the uh, the instrument MVP of the album. The totally, oh, yeah, because that's that's how the album ends is with the, the him hitting the deer antler as the I don't know. It's it's just such a good use and great track. And I guess neo folk you would describe that song as. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And that one and that again that harkens back to. The dead can dances with the uh, mm -hmm. the as Jimmy mentioned the uh, use of percussion in non-standard metal ways. That's a very dead can dance thing. And then after that one, you were but a ghost in my arms is my oh. second favorite track off oh, the album oh, after uh, in the shadow. That mm -hmm. one I think harkens back the most to pale folklore, and it's just beautiful and epic and the the use of the wind samples and stuff. And then I just love it builds up and builds up and builds up. And then there's a break in the music and it comes back with him just shouting, I damn this oak, I damn this sorrow. It's, uh, it's it gives me chills every single time. Like as much as I listen to it, chills every time. Uh, and then Hawthorne Passage is just, it's a post-rock song. Like For that sure. right there is God is an astronaut or explosions in the sky there's my cat uh there he is yeah <laughs> he had to make an appearance of course and it's it's beautiful and i like i like the uh the dialogue that they use or the the sound clips especially one from the seventh seal uh yeah the movie the, the, yeah, yeah. The, uh, Nor norwegian uh direct, what's his name Fuck, I can't think of his name. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Ing Ingmar Bergman? Yeah. Bergman, I believe. Yep. Yeah, Ingmar Bergman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What it's... a killer, what a killer, killer movie. If you've never seen it, oh, you got to see it. It's incredible. It's death. It's the guy. And I'll tell you, that this album is that movie encapsulated. It's, it's yes. man trying to make a deal with death, essentially. Yes. And I, I just death like, is uh, the great leveler, you know? Yeah. It ends with uh, the line, which I had to translate for this. It's one person saying, or, you know, the main character of that movie, who are you? And then the other guy just says, I am death. And that's the end of uh, the Hawthorne passage. And then I think it's just great that it ends on such a more of a depressing note. Like Hawthorne passage almost sounds hopeful. It's, uplifting like the oh, right. post-rock melodies are really just building you up kind of and then it ends with the great cold death of the earth and uh the desolation song which are both just fucking depressing you know like and i i think it kind of just sums up where john kind of was at at this point you know and the desolation song especially so I've definitely talked a lot, of, probably longer than I should have about this. Uh, this for me so, is so. Where yeah, where's that fall in your pantheon there? Second. So second. I didn't I didn't give a ranking to pale or a, a rating to pale folklore because 
seems self-explanatory, right? That's that's your favorite. Ten out of ten. 50 out of 10. I don't know. This is yep. still a 10 out of 10. Uh, just slightly, just a slightly smaller yeah. 10 out of 10. And I think <laughs> it's funny because I know you've given shit to Jimmy in the past being like 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Cap oh, 10 out of 10 you, down there. You, you caught me at my band that I'm like 10 out of 10. So, I got you. Doing it wrong. Nothing wrong with that at all, man. Nothing wrong with that. Real quick, just say hello to some people. Kevin, hey, what's up, dude? Uh, um, Mariano, what's up, brother? Oh, look who's look who decided to grace one of my deep dives with his presence, Mr. Arkham. What's up, bud? Uh, who else we got here? Uh, I thought I saw someone else. Sylvan, what's up, brother? Some good stuff there. Um, Rick, of course. Um, Ryan, what you got on the mantle? I have a feeling this is further up your. Yeah, I have your quite list. a bit on the mantle. Like, I'm Go sure. for it. Everyone else does. So, okay, really quick. Um, my friend Jake Sanders writes for a website called Heaviest of Art. Uh, he knows more about this record than I ever will in my entire life. Um, I just posted that link in the description if you want to read it. It's a great read. He walked around Portland listening to this record and just, like, writes about his thoughts. And, like, it's it's a great read. And then part two of that is an interview he did with all the members of Agaloc this year. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So it's, it's a really cool. It's really worth reading. Um, and that segues wait, into, like. Wait, where did you post that? In the chat on YouTube. Oh, okay, cool. cool. I, I can send it to you personally too after the. After yeah, the I definitely want that. Yeah. So um, that segues into into my notes here because I, I said you can tell they really love Portland just from the art on sure. this record. Even like when they re-released it with that different picture of the same statue, it, it's clear that that was like an integral part of the vibe they were creating with this record. Right. Um, this is my second favorite Agalock release. I I have a really really unconventional favorite Agalock release. Okay. It's, it's probably not something anyone would guess, but this is my second favorite. It is, it, it's an amazing record, obviously. Yes, that doesn't, it is. doesn't even need to be said. Um, yeah, like in the shadow of our pale companion, like I don't need to tell you how good that song is. Um, that, that exact line that Logan referenced is something I was going to bring up that, that I'm, I personally identify as, as a pantheist and that kind of, I, that just really resonates with me. Like, especially, you know, I'm, I'm sure they were going on hikes all the time, living up there in the Pacific Northwest. And oh yeah, yeah the, this is the record I play all the time when I'm hiking, like all the time when I'm hiking. So it's I spent a lot of time listening to this, and it really evokes nature for me. Like every single song has has a, a memory tied to it of being outside. Um, so yeah, in the Shadow of Pale Companion is amazing. Lyrics are amazing. Um, Odal is an incredible track. The mm. piano at the end is one of my favorite Agalock moments. Like mm -hmm. it is like heartbreakingly beautiful. It is it is so pretty. Um, I am the Wooden Doors, probably one of their most black metal songs, which you know puts it in high esteem as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah, Desolation song has that has that folky like neo folk vibe. Um, I just I love this record. I love the sequencing. They really they really knew what they were doing. You know, a lot of really long songs on this record, but like in the shadow of our pale companion, it doesn't feel like it's 15 minutes long. Um, it, none of the tracks feel like they overstay their welcome. They're just perfectly crafted. This is an incredible release. I mean, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jimmy and you because you can probably do do it more justice than I can. But yeah, I love this record. No, nah, dude, that this is all about what this you know, as as always. These albums are important to us, man. They're they're touchstones to our lives, right? And you just said for you, you know, probably in your top one or two of hiking albums. So that tells me everything because I know you and Jimmy are super connected to that lifestyle. And I, I can totally see it. Um, I've done some hiking, but not the kind of hiking that you guys have because on the East Coast, I don't quite have that kind of grandeur to to go hike it don't get me wrong pennsylvania's got some beautiful areas and you get up into new york and, and vermont and, and new hampshire and whatnot but um when this album came out one thing to keep in mind for me was that i already had started a family at 28 i had two young children so i don't i don't think you guys have kids right it's uh it's a bit different you're listening and your, your ability to concentrate and listen and focus as a 30-something-year-old guy with two babies is a little different than 
you know, I couldn't just jump in the car and go hiking and head, you know what I mean? I, so my experience was a little more insular where this album touched me in the ways that it touched you, but on a level that it was up, it was kind of an escape for me from the stressors of work. And I was, I had a, a job I hated at the time. I was an accountant when this album came out, I was an accountant for a pretty large company and I fucking hated being an accountant. I hated the corporate bullshit. I was not very good at it either. I was not, I was really not a good accountant at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would listen to this at work and it would kind of help. I'm a high stress guy, very high stress guy and very ADHD and, and all that kind of stuff. And this allowed me to kind of tunnel vision into something. So Jimmy, I'll get to my notes in a minute, but Jimmy, I know this one's important to you too. So, uh, Let's go to you and get your thoughts on the mantle. Yeah. Um, well, what's interesting about this record is, uh, you know, I was already into the band when it dropped. And uh, I remember downloading it off of, uh, you know, I, what was the one that came after Napster? Audio Galaxy, I think it was. Or, you know, at this time, like, you know. I trying, don't remember. LimeWire. LimeWire. Yeah, was well, I, mean, I think it was Audio Galaxy. But I remember thinking, like, uh, you know, already having – Pale folklore and not quite developing my feelings about it yet at the time. Um, this album dropped, and I was like, "Oh, these guys got a new record. Oh, let me go check this out." And honestly, I mean, this was the record that helped me develop my feelings for Pale Folklore because at the time I was still like trying to figure out where I sat with it, which I knew I liked it a lot, um, but it really just reinforced what I felt about this band. Um, listening to this because it was definitely different. I mean, of course it's a bit, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to go too far because I think that everything that Logan and Ryan pretty much everything you guys said encapsulates the way I feel about this record in terms of the, uh, uh, the lyrics and the, the feeling and the, the journey, I, I would definitely say, um, you know, if you look at the discography, this is, you know, I'll go back to the term cinematic. This is the most cinematic record that they put out. I mean, in terms of like concept and, and just yeah. the feeling of it as you, you know, it's, it's, it, it's the most like well put together, like in terms of like the songs, you know, flowing in, uh, from start to end, it feels like I w just watched, you know, the seventh seal or something like that. Like it just, you know, it, it all flows in that, in that way. So uh, one of the things that wasn't mentioned is that I, I think I remember hearing Hom talk about that, this this record very much was a homage to to their hometown portland you know and, mm. and i even talked about the hawthorne passage which you know if you go if you ever go to portland uh there's the hawthorne theater there's a lot of Hawth hawthorne uh places I, I still i'm not sure who hawthorne is i should have researched it for this but um, yeah i'm not sure either but uh but he talked about the hawthorne passage being uh this is supposed to be what it feels like when you you know, you jump in the car in Portland and you drive through the city and you drive up to Mount Hood, which is a, a crazy high mountain uh, next to the city. Uh, very difficult uh, mountain to to uh, you can't hike it. It's a mountain mountaineer route. Uh, but hiking up to the mount or driving up to the mountain and taking the round trip around back to Portland is what his feeling was about that song. Um, and in addition to all the things that the guys were talking about, like uh, with, with, with the lyrics and uh, the lyrical content, which I think really kind of built upon what they were, you know, trying to convey in Pale Folklore, uh, was, was even more so conveyed in this record in terms of like, you know, like Pale Folklore, the lyrics were very much more kind of a meta, you know, um, you know, sort of like the death of man kind of thing, like, you know, just the, the first tasting of the antithesis of, uh, you know, concrete in society. But this was fully realized, I think, in the lyrics with this record is, you know, you guys were talking about, uh, you know, those lines and in, in the shadow of our pale companion. But uh, I, I wanted to share something with you guys uh, that I took a trip to Portland myself and uh, I went to the very site. I knew um, it. I knew you were there. <laughs> uh, it's not going to come across awesome. very well in the, in the phone, but oh, uh, this is in the very middle of uh, downtown Portland where they photographed us. Right. I'm sure That's you guys right. recognize yep. that. So, yeah. Uh, yep. All the pictures they use. Yeah. In the booklet all of them. Wrong. And all the, this is the fountain that is uh, along the, uh, the, 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 deer, uh, the elk there. 
Um, and of course there's me in front of the elk, um, and kind of, kind of see it looks, looks awful. But, uh, I think I took one picture that, that kind of shows you like, that's kind of what the cover the scale. Uh, yeah, it looks scale terrible. You can't really see it, but that's it. That's the, that's the deer, uh, or the elk. And it's right in the middle of downtown Portland. It's funny. You can't like, it's right in the middle of a, a hard, uh, uh, cross section. So you got to like park and go run up to it and kind of, kind of look at it. But, um, I think that, you know, this, this record really encapsulated their feelings about the city and, uh, and, and what it meant to them. And, um, you know, uh, but, you know, talking about the music, I, I don't want to go too far, you know, uh, everything that Logan and, and, uh, and Ryan said, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, um, in that this was, you know, again, the record that made me realize how great this band was because I was still processing pale folklore and, um, Oh my God. I mean, there's so, there's so much I, I could spend, you know, I'm not going to try and just, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time like talking about every track because every, every track is so meaningful to me. Um, but they just really nailed it. I mean, they, they, they went a little bit further, I think. And, and, sh and, and, and everything feels like, so, you know, the important thing when you write music like this, when you write a, a you know, a big epic, like, you know, in the shadow of our pale companion and make it sound like you know, 10 minutes that goes by that quick is because it's so good. And so like, it, it just, it just develops and, 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 uh, and, and, and builds upon things that are to me feel like pretty natural and logical to these guys at this point, you know, um, that it was kind of effortless in a sense. And I'm sure it was not effortless when they wrote it, you know, but um, it just definitely feels that way. And that's a very hard thing to uh, accomplish as a band, especially at this juncture, uh, you know, a band that's coming out with something very, very new sounding. Um, and, and, you know, to say that, like, maybe they were sort of the, uh, you know, some of the progenitors of the American black metal scene. Well, I mean, this couldn't be a further step. Away. I mean, I, you couldn't step that much further away than you did with this, because, I mean, this is very much, to me, uh, a neo-folk album, you know, with some black metal leanings here and there, um, but is not... Uh, indicative of what they would go to uh next in developing their sound i think it you know, almost felt to me like this is what they were really needed to get out of their systems before they would really consider themselves a, a full band you know because at this point they're not a touring entity and no, i was just going to say they haven't toured yet yeah i mean they might have played live once or twice i mean uh but this is very much a i feel like and you can feel it in music as a labor of love for sure it's and, a it's a studio it, creation for sure. Yeah. And uh, it sounds wonderful. And and it, just like Logan and Ryan were saying, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the instrumentation, I mean, that, that the sound of that, uh, the, uh, the, the elk horn, you know, clicking against each other gives me goosebumps just to think about it. You know, it just, you know, you hear the reverb on it and it's like, God damn, like, how did they, I mean, it's so natural, but it's just so fucking effective, you know? And uh, it, 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 it carries on through the record in, in the different instrumentation they use. Um, and it's a fine, fine blend of all their influences and what ultimately they created something new and special, you know, in taking those influences in. And, you know, that's, to me, that's, that's, you know, what I hope for bands going forward is that, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to be influenced or even maybe steal something from another band, but if you can take it and really make it your own, I mean, that's a rare thing. And these guys completely accomplished that with this record. So, yeah. Um, so what, so that's a easy 10 out of 10, right? Or is yeah. it a 20 out of, or a 20 out of 10? I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I mean, even if the drumming is like kind of off on I am the wooden doors, which it is. And even that song kind of took me a while before I warmed up to it, but yeah, I, I, I don't have any problems with it at all. And it's, it's, yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't find a flaw to this day. You know, you guys summed it up a lot. I'll hit a couple of key points. I think one of the things to point out that's kind of important on this album is all of the artwork is in black and white or grayscale, rather, I would say. And I think that's important because this album has very much a grayscale kind of emotional vibe to it. Um, it's you, you. It ranges the dynamics of emotions from ethereal highs to really deep, sorrowful lows. 
And if there was a bright, colorful rendering of that deer on the front, it would feel more like, uh, I don't even know what band to say it would sound like, but it w I would think that it would be more like, you know, oh, look, it's an upbeat, you know, happy album, but it's it's not an upbeat, happy album. None of their albums are upbeat and happy. They're not doomy depressive either. They're not suicidal black metal or anything like that, but they're, they're without question um, sorrowful. And this album with that grayscale artwork and just the titles of the song a celebration for the death of man in the shadow of our pale companion uh you were but a ghost in my arms they're all very sorrowful mournful melancholic titles that evoke you know i love upbeat pop i love you know abba i love the bgs but the music that always gets in my soul is the shit that makes me want to cry, the stuff that makes me feel most human. And this album is one of those type albums because it it kind of encompasses the human experience. And and I think, uh, Logan, you said the, the lyrics to uh, In the Shadow. Most all of John's lyrics and most all of John's songs are about the struggle for a greater truth and greater understanding and to look at yourself and find where you fit in in, in this world of, of suffering because the world really does suffer a lot there's a lot of suffering out there human suffering and to bring in the pantheistic mo mode of thinking you you have to be accepting of the fact that you're a tiny speck of dust in this gigantic universe and you are what you are and you you assimilate to that pantheism which is you're a part of everything you're an energy you come into this world as an energy and you leave as an energy and you know that that's what this album symbolizes to me and that grayscale artwork really really nails that home uh in the shadow you know like you said um it's a 15 minute track that just encapsulates everything they do well it pulls you in it sucks you in and before you know it you're like whoa that's it it's over i want more of that you know so you get some more because as the album unfolds you get odal which is this great amazing post-rock song again that you said it logan but that's exactly what i wrote great post-rock song uh, the guitar parts that cascade into each other, super evocative, amazing post-rock slash metal. Um, I'm the Wooden Door. That's probably my least favorite track on the album. The drumming just does something weird. The Lodge, man, that's a cool instrumental. Those delayed guitar notes that cascade into each other. And, and um, John was really working John's a guitar nerd, man. That guy sat down and fucked around with effects endlessly to come up with these tones and to come up with these arrangements and these these uh, these songs that he's writing where he's using pedal tones and notes that bounce off of one another with, you know, whatever delay settings he's using. And that's a tricky thing, man. As a guitar player, learning how to play with delay is not the easiest thing, Ryan. I'm sure you know that, right? Um it's a it's a feel thing you have to develop. You can't just suddenly kick the delay pedal and be like, "Oh, check me out! I'm so fucking cool, man!" Man, you gotta you gotta learn your way around that to make it not be something that actually interferes with what you're playing, as opposed to accentuates what you're playing. Um, and that song really, really, really uh, uh, displays its best. You Were But a Ghost in My Arm, probably my favorite track on the album. I love that one. It's The intro is really cool, and then it just gets crushingly heavy. Hawthorne Passage, again, really great song. I think the Hawthorne Passage could be the theme song to a Spaghetti Western. It has the Spaghetti Western vibe to it for some reason. Um, and The Great Cold Death of the Earth, the cello on there. I don't know if it's upright bass or cello. Man, that just makes it stand out. And again, here's a black metal band that's not afraid to bring a cello or a viola or 
a congo or a you know a bone whistle or something into the mix because it's unique and different sets it apart you're not going to hear that on a mayhem record you're never going to hear that on an immortal record you're not even going to hear it on an, an emperor record maybe an enslaved record maybe somewhere but that's enslaved a different animal but uh and you know that if you watched our deep dives uh last thing uh, desolation song very cool ending uh, again this is my introduction to the band uh, by reading the review and and man it just it struck a nerve right away i do think that the drumming again isn't the greatest it, it, it still is probably the one element of the album that i noticed the most it sticks out like a sore a slightly sore thumb to me but as you guys have said maybe i'm being a little too harsh and a little too over hypercritical of that um this thing has a specialness to me uh because it's very different from a lot of the other black metal that was coming out at the time. And um, I give this a nine and a half out of 10 only because of the drumming. Um, I would have said prior to us doing this deep dive, if you just said to me, Hey man, what's your favorite uh, Agalock record? It wouldn't, I wouldn't have hesitated and said the mantle after doing the deep dive and listening a little further. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not, it's man, it's one and one A are super close. So let's move on. Uh, we got a bunch of splits coming up, or not splits, uh, single or not singles. Come on, EPs. We got the tomorrow, uh, what's it called? Tomorrow will never come, right? Wait a minute, what the hell? Can't I haven't read, heard uh, that one. <laughs> yeah, 52703. Do you have that one, Jimmy? I don't, I don't okay. have a copy of that one, but it's. I'm I'm going to yank that one out. I have it. It's, um, yeah. but I'll get it at the end and show it real quick. Um, that one I have is a, a 500 limited, uh, signed, hand signed, JM signed it, and, uh, it's numbered out of 500. I'll pull it then. Um, it's two tracks, quite frankly. Death of Man version three is kind of cool. Tomorrow will never come. There's a mental illness track where a guy's talking and, and there's a lot of dialogue in it. Eh. If it's on the compendiums later, I wouldn't go out and search this out. It's just not, for me, that critical to own. How about you guys? Anything to say on that one? Literally, I've heard it in my life. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's easy to pass over. I mean, it's it, it's cool. You know, the first track is kind of ambient. The second track, there's some cool acoustic stuff. But I think it was kind of just sort of left. I, I don't think it really is worth really delving in too far. Yeah, it's not it's not a critical thing to own at all. Um uh, then also there is the Gray EP, which came out uh, on Vendalus Records. Um, this includes Chris Green, I believe, on drums. And this was limited to 1,000 copies, came out February 29th, 04. You have that one, Jimmy? Um, I have, uh, I have oh, a, you have a, the, a the edition comp. of it on. Uh, this is the White Division Gray. The comp, yep. It's the yeah, comp, right, and right. I, I bought this the first time I saw the band live. Um, you know, because you couldn't get this anywhere else, but it's it's but, the white EP and the gray EP together. Um, I, I any any thoughts on the gray EP? Not really. I mean, uh, if if and if anybody will get to the white EP, but I mean, like, uh, you know, they did uh repress the gray EP on uh on vinyl, uh, Eisenwald. I mean, uh, yeah, Eisenwald did. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I mean, I like the Lodge version, I think it's kind of cool, just like a jam sort of thing, but um, you know, I I, I would hey, say Nick. this is most mostly a forgettable kind of EP that's not really too important compared to some of the other EPs. I mean, it's not, you know, bad if you're a purist though, it's kind of worth seeking out, but uh, I do like, again, I do like the lodge kind of jam session that they did here, but it's just, you know, very inferior to the original version, which it's, you know, you can't, you can't it's very, about. very it's repetitive. Cool. It's yeah. very repetitive though. It's just it, almost to the point where you're like, okay, what did you really add to the song here? I didn't, I didn't find anything on the gray EP that I felt was necessary to own. No. Um, I, if I bought, I don't own the white. I have a burn of the white EP. When when it came out, my buddy sent me a burn of it. I thought I actually had it, but I don't. Um, but I would grab the compendium piece that you have. The, what's it called again? Oh, the again. white division gray. Which it's got, yeah, it's you want to show both. that one more? It's show one more time. It's, it's white division gray. So it's got the white EP and the gray EP. Um, and it's uh, got nice. it's got the uh, ambient remix of that one track. Yeah, right? it's a it's a two CD set, so you can see the gray artwork right. and then the white the white EP artwork. Oh, and, that's uh, cool. I, like again, I just bought this because it's yeah, you know, it's kind of a collection. Got them both. I actually released this on vinyl as well, but you can only get it on the on the tour. Uh, I don't. 
I don't think they had it on nail order or anything, but um, you know, so I, I bought it just cause I, I have, I have to have multiple versions of the white. We'll get to that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, I think this one is for collectors only and I get it. If you're a collector, I don't think I, I think I'd buy that, that double CD if I could find it. Um, uh, last thing, uh, there was a split they did eight, two Oh four with nest. Um, the end put it out as a 10 inch pick disc, I believe the wolves of the Timberline. That's actually a really cool track. Actually. That's I think that's track. pretty neat. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. cool instrumental with, and I really like this, the, uh, the ending of it where it, it fades into the synthy bits of the nest, uh, track, which is last vestige of old joy, synthy folky. Did never, I've never heard of Nest before. First time I've ever heard of them, but it's pretty neat. I like it. Would I, if I found it in a store for relatively cheap, which I wouldn't because of Discogs, but if I did, I would, I'd grab it. Um, but I wouldn't go out there pounding the pavement and lighting up the uh, internet to find a copy of it. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on those real quick? Nope. No. All right, cool. Let's move on then to. Ashes against the grain. You got that one? Uh... Oh, of course. See that so one? I got, I got, well, this is the CD. Booklet, but... Well, booklet, yeah. I'm trying to remove the glare. And then I got, this is also the end. Oh, nice. Repress from 2015. Yeah, this so... came out on August 8th, 2006. Again, mm-hmm. producer Rod Chick, Ron Chick, uh, John Holm. Uh, Ron also plays Ebo and piano on this. Um, so after the release, real quick, just a quick little bit of history. After the release of the Mantle, they did their first live shows actually, um, and they added as as we said, Chris Green on drums. Yeah. I don't really know where he came from. I didn't bother to go that deep because he only sticks around for a short while um, because they felt he wasn't kind of advancing the way that he should as a live drummer. Um, yeah, yeah, so go ahead, uh, go ahead and hit me on, uh, hit me up on this one, Logan. So, first off, I will say when I when I got this, uh, this one took me the longest to actually get into and to actually appreciate of the first three albums, and I think it's because the the first two, they are so much more. Like you just have to really dive in and like kind of feel it out. The the, the songs are so unique and go to such a unique passage and stuff. It's adventurous. It's exciting. And that's not to say that this is not like that, but the songs are a lot more individualized, if you will, and a lot more linear. You know, like they follow like a a verse chorus almost kind of pattern i mean there's still like the agalock twist and stuff i'm not trying to say that they just wrote verse chorus verse chorus bridge kind of songs but when you're comparing it to the mantle or to uh pale folklore it it definitely kind of comes off like that and it, it took me a little bit to wrap my head around the fact that they were really focused more on writing individual songs here and really trying to hone all of the many different influences, the post-rock, the neo-folk, the black metal, the heavy metal, uh, even through goth in there, Jeff, and I, I guess I would agree with that as well. Like all, all of that into like a universal sound and it like just into individual songs, you know? And as soon as I kind of started to try to listen to it at, and just appreciate each song for what they were versus trying to look at it as like a album as a whole that's when this one clicked with me and like for me this is 10 out of 10 uh third time in a row uh okay <laughs> every like literally because glad i'm not the only one every single song is perfect i there's not a fault in any of them i mean uh limbs opens up with just really just barreling in on that heavier aspect of post-rock it's probably the most beautiful 
song on the album i would say it's fucking epic just dude. so epic. epic especially the ending you know like oh, you think that you think so that intro good. is beautiful and then the ending comes in where it's like the cascading guitar melodies and stuff but even more amplified and you just get get chills every time you listen to it yeah that's then, a goosebump song big time right there yeah it definitely and then goose uh sorry falling snow uh might be the most recognizable and probably in my top three Agalock songs just because it's it's just falling snow it just fall it just follows such an epic uh structure like the songwriting in the song is top notch you know like the and the drums the drums are perfect too and i, I think they probably got rid of the drummer because he sounds like he's playing very similar to what Hom was he playing. very much did yeah he, he was doing the exact same things he was doing it without the mistakes Hom well it was should making. it should be noted though that Hom mm -hmm. does play uh drums on falling snow and not unlike the waves I did not realize that okay yeah. mm -hmm. oh I okay so I can definitely or wait a minute that hold on. on falling snow yeah 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 that's it he did play on those yep, yeah yep. which falling snow just because the the first half of the song is the linear songwriting, you know, mm -hmm. and then it goes into the ending of the song where it's just like a a guitar note like ringing out, and then the drums come back in, mm -hmm. which I will air drum to that the the drums coming in every single time, you know. It goes very like, very boom. very Godspeed, it's, you Black oh, Emperor. Yeah. It's it's just epic, and then it just goes right back into the intensity of the song. The ending of it is probably one of the best Agalock moments, and yeah. And then, uh, to me, the weakest song, but the, the song that I've probably appreciated the most recently is, uh, what is it? As, as Above, So Below, or As okay, Fire Above, Ice Below, is that it? Fire above, Fire above, ice below. Yeah, yeah. That one probably is the most post-rock kind of song, but it has a similar climax to what Limbs had, you know? And I just think it's a good, like, middle interlude kind of song to bridge the first part to Not Unlike the Waves, which is my second favorite song off the album after uh, Falling Snow. The most epic, you know, black metal song. He gets some uh dsbm kind of like howling just pained vocals in that song mm -hmm. and the groove is just perfect so uh i don't want to try still too much about, about the individual tracks i our fortress is burning probably took me the longest to like appreciate but it's probably the most the closest to the mantle in songwriting because it's it's very conceptual in that it just flows versus, you know, goes the linear route. And uh, one more time, Aham is still on the same mentality when it comes to writing lyrics as he was on the mantle. The line, the god of man is a failure and all of our shadows are ashes against the grain. The final, final line of this, I think that just continues to sum up the ethos of the band and... I don't know just why they really kind of mean so much. So that's, I'll end there. But wait, no, sorry. If I were to recommend someone a Agalock album to get to start with, this would be it. Because this is the perfect just entry point, I think. And now I'm good. I'm sorry. We're good. I think, uh, yeah, I, I want to actually touch on that in a minute here. Um, Ryan, how about you? Um I did want to say one quick thing. Where did I lose my? Oh, real quick. I, I could not find my Agalock shit, unfortunately. It's buried in one of my boxes from the move, and I, I couldn't find it. But this one came out in a a vinyl of a 1,000 copies on March 2nd, uh, 07, from the end. And then uh, I can't read my fucking notes. Um, three different colors, clear orange, splatter. 200 uh black 400 and clear orange 400 um the other thing that and my stuff that i wanted to show off which unfortunately i'm not gonna be able to find is um 
it came out the cd came out in a wooden box version and the, it was 500 of these and it was a wooden box had a slip cover that you pulled like a like a, a sliding little like a grooved what do you call that when you like a dovetail jointed box really neat little box right with a sliding uh wooden <laughs> cover that like came a out die cut die cut sleeve or no it's not die cut um Oh, shit. When it has, like, two channels, like your drawers would go into, slide into a drawer, it has, like, that kind of a... It's just a really neat, like, presentation. Then inside it were some Polaroids, not Polaroids, um, like black and white photos. And then there was ashes in a baggie from a fire they probably were hanging out at or or they burn in their backyard, who knows, in, the, in their whatever. But it had that, and then it had the slipcover version of the CD in it. And I wish I could find it, but unfortunately, I can't find it. So, um, Ryan, what you got on this one here? All right. So, uh, first thing I wrote about this record is this is an album of huge riffs, which yes, sort of sort of dovetails off of what Logan was saying, where these songs feel more like self-contained. I would say definitely uh, more just like a traditional metal up approach, I guess, just like catchy hooks but i mean still killer record obviously uh limbs is probably one of my favorite aglock songs um the the really heavy like post-rock section at the beginning is great and but like the glockenspiel or whatever right after that mm -hmm. where that song just takes a really really dark turn um the the from that por portion to the end of the song that's like one of my favorite bits of aglock's music it's it's absolutely incredible and the the riff after that like glockenspiel or whatever i don't know what it is but killer yeah, the riff after that is it, like it sounds like a dark throw riff or something. It's like yeah, straight up black metal, and I, I just love that. Um, uh, Falling snow. I, I mean, nothing needs to be said. That is such a good song, um, and it's it's probably like their most most triumphant song. It's it's very uh, upbeat for Agaloc, but they still manage to you know to to fit that into their style. Um, Let's see. Uh, not unlike the waves. That's also. I mean, I feel like I have a lot of superlatives for this record, but uh, not unlike the waves. I feel like the intro intro to that song is like one of their heavier moments. Um, I don't know. That's their. Like that's that's kind of their metal track on this album. I think yeah. it was the. It's the one they did their first video for too. I believe. Yes, right. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and I, I feel like maybe they were like consciously pushing the the envelope with the tracks on this record. Um, because that's really heavy, and it doesn't really harken back to anything they had done before, in my Agreed. opinion. Like, it, like Agreed. that's just a very heavy song. Um, I think maybe in general, this might just be their heaviest record. But I agree. Yeah, there's just a lot, a lot of really good stuff going on on this record. Um, you know, if you like the more highbrow sort of, you know, obviously it's still very like philosophical, but like it's not the manhole where they're like almost telling a story throughout. You know, a seventy minute record. It's just like kind of more about the music i think on this one but yeah incredible record i can't say enough good things about it so where does this one fall on your but this is not your number one though is it oh no it's not okay, um, all right. i i think i might like pale folklore a little more than this one but like wow it, again i'm very um i'm very generous with my uh my perfect scores too so i would say all of their all of their full lengths are perfect records to me so it, it's there's kind of a lot of churn like it kind of depends just what i'm in the mood for but it, this is this is somewhere in the middle of the pack as well, I would say. Okay. And I don't want you to, like, if you have more to say, man, just say it. I know, I don't know where you're sitting at as far as having to stick around or leave, but, um, you know, I'm trying to move as quick as I can, yeah, but we have sure. a lot to say about these albums. So I don't want you to go, oh, I got to hurry up because, you know, if you have other stuff to say about it, say it. You know what I Definitely, mean? Definitely, yeah. No, not at all. Um, I do probably need to bounce around nine, but... Okay. In general, I, I I genuinely I'm not just saying this to be like humble. I feel okay. like you guys have this covered a, a bit more than me. Like Logan's no, Logan got it down, Jimmy's got it down, you've got it down. So no, nah, I mean, but you know, the the whole thing for me and why I do these deep dives is not about my opinion. It's about all of our opinions. I really, Jimmy knows this, man. If, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times. My deep dives are only as good as you guys. Sure. I can sit here and wax poetic about a lot of shit, and people are going to tune me out. I think people tune in to hear a multifaceted uh, panel talk about these albums. So far we've had, I've been the only guy that's been semi-negative about the drumming. It does get better. 
uh, which we should add that after this album, Aesop Decker from Ludicra joins the band. Um, I don't know Ludicra. I don't know anything about him, but I do know he's drummed in quite a few bands. So, um, but yeah, I want to, again, I, I, the dynamic is what I'm after when I do these. So, um, Jimmy, you ready to tackle this one? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I've got another growl pressing of this. Another, according to Hom, is an uh, unofficial release, but, uh, you know, sounds fine. And, uh, you know, at this point, um, you know, at this point when this comes out in 2006, I'm a full fledged fan. You know, I'm all in. And uh, also, it's kind of a, you know, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just, uh, it, I had moved to Colorado at this point. So Agalock released the mantle in 2002, right? So this comes out. It almost feels like there's a four year wait for every record. Right. I think. Um, yeah, about. So at this point um, I was already fully uh, feeling comfortable in Colorado and not really found my kind of stride yet. Um, you know, in terms of like hiking and things like that, but uh when this came out, uh, I was definitely already a full fledged fan and, and uh, really, really stoked and excited for it. And I would say that, uh, you know, right off the bat, I was, you know, blown away, loved it. I mean, uh, I think this is the most mature they've ever sounded in terms of their sound, uh, instrumentation wise. Um, you know, everything just sounds like, you know, if you had any complaints about the drumming or just like some of the, you know, just the playing in general, I think they really kind of streamline things in terms of the performance um, on this. And, you know, so like the mantle, like to me was like, you know, I don't want to say it was like kind of an experiment because it was the second record, you know, I mean, third record is kind of like what make or breaks you right in terms of a, a great band, but uh, um, you know, and the post, the post rock influence really, really kind of shined through on this one, um, but I still felt like they still retained their identity in terms of uh, what they have been doing so far. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, they just, they sound like they really, really kind of have things locked in. And I would also say that like, I mean, and, and they were never like, you know, a victim of this before, but I mean, it really, it really shines through on how perfect and amazing their songwriting progress is, you know, because I mean, like, this band is like the music is not the easiest music to get into, but I mean, it, like if you're willing to invest the time into really like kind of immersing yourself into the album, because I think that's what it kind of takes into to being a fan of this band and to realize like how perfect, I don't know, at least for me, like how just seamless the songwriting is here, you know, because I mean, you can do slow stuff and really come off like just, or, or just like repetitive stuff, you know, like it, it, where, where you have to really let it build and, and ebb and flow um, to, you know, for it to work. I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I'm just trying to say that the songwriting is, is so strong. And so just the music, like, I don't know how they figure out how to make the flow, you know, it's such a flow to it. Um, I'm going to interject a sec here. A reason why, I'm, and, and maybe see if you and I are thinking on the same wavelength. Dare I say, I was hoping Ryan would be on for this. Um, dare I say that maybe just a little bit on this album, this is their mainstream album. And the reason I say mainstream is suddenly some of the awkward, maybe slightly awkward transitions or the, lo the longer passages that maybe were re slightly repetitive, they've been sort of shed. And this is a streamlined sort of beast. Absolutely. And what I hear here is not a band that's looking to get radio play. They're never going to get radio play with 10 and 12 minute, and nine minute and seven minute tracks. It's just, and, and, they're, and, and a Cascadian black metal neo folk band is never going to get radio play. I mean, that's just not going to happen. But what I hear on this album is there's a lot more earworms, man. They, they, these songs, you hear them and you're immediately struck by, wow, that's fucking badass. You don't need to have repetitive listens. It's almost like th that's the thing. This one, when I hadn't listened to this in years, years and years. And as soon as Limbs came on, I'm like, holy fucking shit. I totally forgot this. 
this is so badass. And it just, then it, it, it builds, it builds from there. It, it goes from strength to strength in a lot of ways, you know, from limbs right. to falling snow to, and it just, you know, and you're like, man, and I won't lie to you. This one actually usurped the mantle a little bit for me. It kind of jumped into that 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. Well, I think you're right. They truly honed it in. They really, really they nailed it. in their songwriting. And, and I mean, like, because they've already hinted at this point how amazing songwriters they are. Right. You know, but they really, really, I mean, just, and I and I felt like, you know, this was the first time where I felt like even though the, the album is sort of a journey from start to finish and it is sort of a, a movie, like like the first two records from start to finish, but not as much. I felt like there was a lot more focus on the songs themselves. And Individual in songs, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, and, and like I, I thought, like they they brought forth like some of the best elements in this record like that that you know for me that makes me love the band and why i was so like blown away when it came out is like even like some of the guitar tunes from pale folklore are kind of inch into here like yeah. uh, uh fire above ice below i mean like man you hear that uh, that really reverby like drawn out uh beautiful guitar tune like throughout the whole song like i was like oh man they they, they got it again, man. They, they brought it back. That's great. I mean, that's, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Um, and, uh, but, but, I mean, you want to talk about like composition, like perfect composition, you need to look no further than our fortress is burning part one and two, you know, because it starts with this wonderful, I mean, just amazing, uh, you know, and their, their, their melodic sense is, I mean, just un, unreal. But I mean, like if you listen to the, our fortress is burning one and two, and the way that they transition into Bloodbirds is like mm -hmm. one of the most like uh, you know emotional like cinematic moments I could almost say. I keep using the word cinematic, but I have to. Um, it just flows so perfectly, and 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 just the way that it like builds and ebbs and flows, and then right when it builds into the Bloodbirds parts, uh, I mean, uh, it just boom, you're right into it, and it's a very very sad somber uh, you know piece, but. God damn, is it effective? And and the only thing that I would say that like I would I would take away a, a ten out of ten for this uh, because it is I mean truly every song on here is some of the best songs I in my opinion they've ever written um, was the uh, the fact that maybe if Shane Breyer was still a member of the band he might have like I felt like the the two uh, ambient pieces on here are kind of lacking like they're not really especially like part three of uh, our fortress is burning. It's just kind of like a bunch of guitar, like, you know, feedback and stuff. And, you know, it's kind of cool, but it just, it just seems like, I don't, it's just not really doing anything for me. And there's that one little two minute interlude. I think it's the white mountains on which you will die. This white. Right. Mountain which yep. you die. It's, yep. it's cool. And it's a nice little like interlude, but like, you know, like Logan was talking about, like they're, they're the Kings of interludes and they kind of, for me, like those two tracks, not a bad thing at all, but it's just if I had anything to gripe about, those two don't really do too much for me in terms of like maybe I thought like, you know, if maybe Briar was still around, he would have like had one magnificent piece to like put in the middle to like segue all this shit. But that's uh, a good point. That's a good. Very point. minor gripe, very minor gripe. This is an amazing, amazing record. Uh, I mean, and, and they are at the top of their game, surely, with so, Ashes Against the Grain. Yeah, I um. Not a lot to, to offer here. You guys nailed it for the most part. Let me see. Um, there's a little less uh, acoustic on here and more atmospheric stuff going on. Um, there's also a lot of very uplifting melodies. They're, the melodies are very up-tempo positive. And I generally gravitate towards the more somber melancholic, but these these are uplifting in an epic sort of way. Um like, you know, we did the Blue Douse Nord thing uh, a couple a month or two ago with Kellen. And, you know, we talked a lot about Cosmosophy. I hear a lot of Cosmosophy and this album have some synonymous sort of vibes to them with their, the, the guitar melodies are just these. They envelop you and they drag you in and whether you, you can't not be hooked by them is really what it is. Limbs just, man, what a, you know, that Ebo goodness. Love that Ebo, man. Who doesn't love a good Ebo? I mean, come on. Um, you got the killer post-rock vibe to it. Just fucking cool as hell. Uh, grandiose Epic. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, Agalock songs for Limbs. Again, another epic 
opening post rock metal goodness song with falling snow it's gorgeous the clean vocals on uh, on that are just amazing actually these the two alternating um uh, again, John really did perfect that alternating pedal tone, you know, ascending, descending sort of riff thing that he would have, where you'd have a pedal tone, a note, where he'd play it off of two or three other notes that were super melodic, and, and then he would suddenly change it into, you know, something that was maybe a major, he would then suddenly drift into minor, and it would just, you know, it would just captivate you. Um yeah, the White Mountain thing is a little bit of a, you know, that's kind of, I, if anything, that's the one I would say is the throwaway track on it. It doesn't really add anything or do anything, really. Fire Above, Ice Below, all I have written is Killer Track. Uh, not unlike The Waves, that's, again, their heavy metal song on this album, man. I don't have a problem with that, man. I mean, Amazing. I love when they get heavy. I love it a lot. Um our fortress is burning the most ambient beginning that slow burn track and right here jimmy i have for bloodbirds building 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 Amazing. then it goes into uh the final instrumental i do like that and the reason i like it is it's so godspeed man it's just this climaxing thing that just falls into like the earth swallows it yeah. and it just sucks it in and just it all decomposes and deconstructs right there before your ears i wanted to jump in on on that too that i really i kind of like how it ends because it to me it sounds like a raging fire yep going out just it's just being point. swallowed yeah. just, just being, being swallowed, swallowed by in. Earth. yeah and i i think when you combine it with the lyrics of you know our fortress is burning i mean well it's in, it's in the name of the song it's well, just, again it's about it really hits i think but that song is very much, again, about John's eternal quest to point out how we're born into suffering and we, we struggle to find meaning in material mm -hmm. things and, and material uh, – because we're all materialistic. I mean, that's what we have. That's what we have, all these, yeah, all well, these things well, we well, have, well, right? Well. But, but in the end, we can't take any of that with us. And – it's that epic build and then that crescendo into the infinite nothing. Yeah. Or is it infinite something? That's the question. The eternal question that none of us will know until it ends. Some of us that's coming a lot sooner than it should. But anyway, um, yeah, man, the last song scars. Oh no, I'm sorry. That was the last song. There's a vinyl track, a bonus vinyl track. I didn't listen to that. Is it called scars? I I don't have that one. <laughs> okay. Maybe I maybe I I don't know why I wrote that I there. Maybe I'm wrong. Heard that. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh anybody want to tie that up? Again, that's a ten out of ten for me. That's my favorite album. Just barely edging out the mantle. I mean just barely. We gotta get to uh Ryan's favorite. I have a feeling that next one that's coming up might be it. No, not the next one, but the one after. Um the white EP comes out on two twenty nine oh eight. Jimmy already showed that. Um I'm going to hit this one real quick. It's a follow-up to the Gray EP from 2004. Tracks were written between 04 and 07. It was limited to 2000. Came out on Vendorless Records. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, lots of samples from The Wicker Man. It's almost predominantly an acoustic-based album. There's very little electric on this. Um, so many of the tracks were inspired by The Wicker Man. There's a... Uh, what's Okay, so the first song, Isle of Summer... Very much all about the Wicker Man. There's all the samples in there. I think Christopher Lee's on this one. Or is he on the last one? He's on the last Chris one. Last yeah, last it's, one. it's not the first one. Yeah. Okay. It's um, the kids chanting on the first one. What a, what a cool, almost classical sounding track. I mean, it's a very happy, beautiful song. Birch Black. Very bluegrassy. Almost bluegrassy. Some of John's most chicken picking, you know, finger picking type goodness that he doesn't do a lot of on on the albums. Really really pretty track, really cool. Uh hollow uh, is it hollow? Can't read my own damn writing. Hollow, hollow stone. Yeah, hollow stone, yep. Man, super cool ambient synth track. Dungeon synthy a little bit, but a little bit more ambient than dungeon. 
Pantheus, man. I love that song. That song is fucking cool as shit. Uh, but Birch White. Birch White's the standout track for me. God damn, that song's amazing. Best track on the album. <laughs> Suilo Rune. Quiet acoustic track. Excellent uh, playing. Nice little interlude. And then Summer Isle Reprise, man. It's just this nice, long, languid, beautiful, lilting reprise of the original th uh, song. So this one's a 9.8 out, out of 10 for me. I love it, man. I fucking love it. Um, all right. Who wants to go next on this one? Jimmy, I'm going to let you go next. White, The white EP clip. <clears throat> yeah, I actually, uh, I got the first uh, CD Venless pressing of this. Oh, look at you. Um, I think they released like 100. Right when it got announced, I jumped right on it just because I love the band so much and I knew what was kind of coming. And uh, anybody that wants to... Uh, Said limited know, to 2,000. I don't know if that's the vinyl or the CD. The CD, uh, yeah, I think it was just the CD. They didn't release yeah. it on vinyl. At first, That's what I so, thought. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, I, I had to jump on, you know. But uh, oh, yeah. uh, anybody that wants a physical release, they uh, Eisenwald did a beautiful new pressing of it. I oh, mean, nice. just, I'm not, I'm not going to take it out, but it's it's really expansive. It's got a lot of stuff in there. Um, I, I really think this should have been the fourth Agalock uh, full length, just because, like, you know, they call it an EP, but. Um, you know, for me, I, I feel like uh, it's long enough to be a full length. And there was actually a bonus track on the, on the vinyl that I had never heard before. And if they would have included that, it would have been long enough to be a full length. So I, for me, I, 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 uh, I look at this album as a, as a full length, uh, the fourth full length, even though it's right. not. Considered so sorry. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, more, I mean, it's one of the most important records in my life. For sure. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's like they just went like full neo folk sort of thing, but it's a lot more than that. It's very like again, like uh, just expansive, uh, atmospheric. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I don't know, man. I just think the vibe here, everything you know, goes right along with what they do. Um, it's more, um, you know, kind of the softer side. And I've got so many people that I've let hear this record that are not into metal and things and like hear this, you know, like, especially like hiker friends or things like that, that kind of like resonated with it. Um, you know, like sitting out in the forest or whatever. And, um, but the one thing I will say is that I think they really, um, used the wicker man samples to an amazing effect. And again, like, you know, I, I think I said this before, but you know, when bands use samples, it usually kind of comes off as, just kind of hokey and like kind of forced, but I feel like they really like wrote those last two songs um, for, you know, what the Wicker Man, I'd never even seen the film until I listened to this and I, you know, went and watched it and kind of understood it and uh, realized how important it was to the whole like conceptual, like message of, of Agalock and uh, what, you know, if you watch that film, you know, like it, it's it's very much those people are, are you know it's it's a pagan thing you know oh yeah and uh, mega. And, and and that um kind of spoke to me in a way that i never really understood what that meant until i listened to this until i watched that film um because of the very lines that they quote or they they use in the samples with christopher lee you know uh in so willow rune where he says you know uh talks about the children and um talks about how God is dead. And I don't know, just the last song, uh, the piano piece, I actually had, um, when I was still on Facebook back in the day, I, uh, I, I used to correspond with Don Anderson a bit. And, uh, I never really realized how important Don Anderson was to this band until this record. And if you kind of go back and, you know, go back to the early records, you realize like a lot of his solos and his, uh, I, I don't know, just, you know, the combination of him and John Hom is such an amazing union. And even I would say Walton uh, to, you know, because Walton's bass is, it's something we haven't talked about. But the bass playing is amazing in those first two records. Um, but these three guys, like kind of what, how they played off each other, kind of like, you don't really get that very often. And um, so the, the last track, you know, being sort of a reprise of the first song, um, it's very important to me. And I, I, I talked to Don a bit and I found out that Don played, I mean, composed and, and played all of that piece. And if you listen to that piece, I mean, it's a true 
classical piece of music. You know, it's not just some kind of phoned in like piano piece. I mean, it's real classical music. And, and uh, the fact that he just like composed that thing from start to finish and, and did it all is kind of mind blowing to me. And uh, the way that they use those, those last few uh, samples of Christopher Lee, uh, you know, where the guy's like, you know, uh, fuck. I try and think you, about what going to be a pagan or a heathen. Yeah. You, you, yeah, you were brought up to be a pagan. He said uh, conceivably, but, conceivably. Uh, heathen, but not likely, you know, and like that just, I don't know, that still to this day when I listen to that, it gives me, God, I mean, extreme goose flesh and just... I don't know. It just resonates, and uh, in a way that I can't. You know, I'm too stupid to try to, you know, explain right now. But it's 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 so evocative. And <clears throat> there was a time where, like, I would hike and I would put that on over and over again, and it would just yeah, like, I could see perfect, that. You know, just like and just the way that the the piano piece goes, like it starts and it's a little like unsettling, but then it goes into this just amazing like it's. It, I don't know, it just like flows in a way that this is like a true classical pianist, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I've even it, let, am I am I wrong? Does Don have a degree in music, I believe? Uh, I think he's I mean he's definitely got multiple degrees that or guy is it, professor. Or is it English or is it English that he was I think uh, he's I think he's a literature professor. Yeah, that's uh, right. But he probably studied music. He had to have you listen to that and you're like, Man, the guy had to have had classical training or something, or you don't just you don't just half-ass something like that, you know. It's yeah, just, right, right. It's too, it's too, man. It's just too perfect. I don't know, but I, 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 I could certainly wax poetic for hours about what this record means to me. Um, but <laughs> it, it truly is like one of the most important pieces of music in my life. Well, we're gonna let Ryan wax a little poetic on it real quick here. Very That's good. Awesome. I get it too. Absolutely. I'm in the same exact boat. This is my third favorite Agalock release. It could be my second. I, I might like this more than the mantle. Um, this is, wow. I mean, this, uh, yeah, this, this is an incredible record and a big part of how I determine, you know, I don't like the nebulousness of trying to think about what I like more. So what I really go to is like how often I listen to a record. Yeah. Very good. I nice. listen to this record all the time, Nice. all the time. And then usually what happens is it makes me want to rewatch the wicker man which I do, and then that makes me want to listen to the EP again. It's just like a endless cycle of things I love. Um, so, I mean, what 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 to say? Um, we've already touched on the Wicker Man quotes. I, I think they're used to perfect effect. Jimmy said it perfectly. They're not like shoehorned in. It's not just like some vapid nod. It, you know, it's, it's very clear that it's part of the thematic arc of the release. Um, I, I Just like Jimmy, I get chills with that last Christopher Lee uh, quote, you know, a heathen conceivably, but not, I hope, an un unenlightened one. That's just... <laughs> yeah. Really Perfect, and also, right? Yeah, and I feel like that that kind of encapsulates, I think, what, what John is going for, you know, with this... It summarizes being human, right? Yeah, no, exactly, yes. I mean, it, it's that balance. And again, like, I think the the... I don't know. The, the classification of Wicker Man is, is a genre called folk horror, which is kind right. of, you know, turned into a much bigger thing than it used to be. But like, that's a genre of film that also resonates with me deeply. I, I often call it the black metal of cinema because it, it's yeah. got those themes of like, you know, addressing death and like, and paganism and like the, the alienation. Yes. Alienation. Exactly. The conflict between the modern ways that people live compared to like the, the historical ways of doing things. Right. And I think that's something that black metal explores. I think that's something that the Wicker Man specifically very <clears throat> explicitly explores. And that's what this, this release is doing. And so it, I just feel like energized when I just thinking about this record makes me feel like energetic and listening to me it. Too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's great hiking music. Like I hike to it often. Um, I, I like that it's all folk. Um, I think, I guess it kind of let them explore that side of the, the band a little more um, where these aren't just interlude tracks because all of these, you know, could have been like interlude tracks on any of sure. the four Yeah, sure. I like that they just stuck the folk with this release. And like yep. Jimmy said, especially with um, Where Shade Once Was, which I, I think is the bonus track, 
it, it's like a 40 minute it's a full length um i don't know if it's classified as an ep just so they could like it is yeah, sort of like know, it's, it's a but i get you yeah the yeah. band you know what i mean but i you know i i like what jimmy said i, I think it is full length and i think they just took a different approach with this one and it it really paid off um I, I, yeah, I don't have much else to say. Pantheus, like you said, that's a beautiful song. I love that song. Ah, it's amazing. And it, it's cool to see it like explicitly um, um, referenced that, you know, that's sort of probably where they're coming from. And I like, too, that it has, you know, Aglock in general, but like this release, I really feel it. it it's not the like um, anti religion of traditional black metal. It's, you know, they're offering like a an ideal that's you know, they're offering an alternative right it's not just like the i've, I've been saying this in, in multiple places now at this point but I'm, I'm tired of the over the top satanic stuff it's just it's silly to me at this point and i like that agalog has this like, positive ideal that they're offering you know here's here's a better way i think of of being a human being in this world and it's not like it's not christian it's still anti-christian it is but they're doing it in a way that's like thoughtful and presenting something that that's a, a viable alternative i think um you know I, I didn't even think about any of that beforehand that was that was completely yeah. impromptu, so um, that's that's right on honestly i'm gonna I leave think it there because i think that's a place to stop they're just questioning religion and like its purpose and how humankind in the modern world should search for religion among the current society i think and that's that's a great point yeah i um the the one thing that in listening to this it made me pick up my acoustic it made me want to pick up my acoustic and start you know fleshing out some things i i have a song i've been working on with my daughter who's a singer that is amazing and uh, actually logan's heard her um and i was writing these sort of cool little finger picked you know riffs and i as soon as i listened to this yesterday i was like man i got a i haven't played in a while like way too long like long enough that my calluses were painful. They're painful because I, unfortunately, because of my nerves, nerve, nerves, and my health in general, I'm always, you know, chewing on my fingers. It's terrible, but it's a disgusting habit. But it is what it is. But man, I picked up my guitar and I was like, oh man, it was just made. It made me really dig down into my guitar playing yesterday for quite a while until my fingers said, "Fuck you, stop this for right now." It really hurts. Um, but yeah, it's it's gorgeous, and um, the the whole concept of you know I'm I'm a borderline atheist, and I only say that I'm I'm a hard I'm a hard right agnostic is what I am, and that's only because I I guess I want to hold out that tiny little smidgen of hope, even though I know it's probably not realistic. At least for me, I don't think it's realistic. Um, but. The whole satanic thing is just so played out, man. It's been so played out for so long. And I never took it, you know, I go back to high school with Number of the Beast in 82 and, you know, people burning those records at concerts and all that stupidity. And you're like, really, man? Like, are you kidding me? You know, and it's like just the hard holy rollers versus the satanic people. What's the difference, man? I mean, you're just praying to something that probably doesn't exist anyway. So it's like, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of silly to me, to be honest with you. I get it. Ooh, it's Satan. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I love, I love Merciful Fate and King. It's great. It's, but it's horror. It's like watching horror movies. You know, that's all it really is, you know? Yes, very much. And I think even like with Venom specifically. Oh, yeah. Tongue in cheek. They, they didn't take it seriously. It, it was not serious. And then you had, you know, the, the, Norwegian kids in the in the nineties who did take it seriously. Exactly. Because it was a form of rebellion. And I understand the the idea behind it, but A, it's just been done to death. But more importantly, like you're still working within the Christian tradition. Exactly. Like, Satan you, is, is you, you can't have Satan without God. So, right. so if God is dead and you want to shit on God and Satan's the, the way, it's like right. what's well, you just changing your allegiance from one to the other, and okay, so one's all do the bad stuff. Yeah, and do and what like, thou you're, will. You're picking the losing side anyway. Real, like, sa real Satanists. Yeah. Real Satanists. The whole, you know, the Crowley say or not Crowley, um, Levay and stuff like that. It's, dude, it's about getting laid and 
hooking up with chicks and it's yeah it's, it's hedonism just, that's all it is hedonism. well that's yeah, that's yeah. what Crowley was too yeah but yeah yeah exactly that's, so that's all right different. logan give me some quick thoughts on the ep whoa shit sorry uh -oh. dude i kicked you out i hit the wrong button sorry honestly, about that. honestly it is fair because uh my take on this is well guys i, I think i screwed up oh you didn't uh, listen to this I listened to it once in preparation okay. for the stream, and I listened to the gray EP like four or five times. Uh, you made the, you made a big mistake because <laughs> I was I was going chronologically through like the EPs and everything, so I was like trying to like you know kind of dive into the gray EP and be like, what's here? What's here? Not much, and I only listened to this one time. That's right, and yeah. So you told me that real quick and I, I have nothing to add. It's it sounds beautiful. It's uh, all acoustic, which is impressive. I really want to hear like where they go with it. While everyone else is talking, I'm currently in Eisenwald making an order for this CD right now. Oh, so I'm going to have it on, on its way to me. You won't be disappointed. By, by the end of the night, I'm excited. Uh, the one thing I kind of want to add actually about it is that the right off the gate, the sound clips from the wicker man wicker man definitely stood out to me uh i actually have not seen the wicker man so that's also on my to-do list um but it makes me think and just how well they're used and how well they're placed and how much they add actual gravity and weight to the music makes me think of what they do on a forthcoming ep that we will talk about shortly so that's that's all i got i will I will do better. In the awesome. Mariano makes a great point here. The whole satanic panic shit from the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, yeah, it, it'd be, it, it is kind of a joke. You know what I mean? Yeah, we could get down that rabbit hole. That's for another stream, I'm sure. But, you know, I, I just think it's kind of hysterical that all these real hardcore evil satanic, satanic people want to destroy God, but you can't have God. You can't have Satan without God. You can't have God without Satan. So it's just, you know, whatever. All right. Um, we're moving on real quick. The demonstration archive. I think you showed that right, Jimmy. Okay. And that came out. Um, that's a cop of the early stuff the, uh, of stone, wind and pillar, uh, the demos and the promo 98 demos. Um, and also that was, Released by Leek von Dammering and Art House in 2008, and then reissued as a box set, I believe, in vinyl in 2012 by Eisenwald. Uh, one other thing to mention is 2009, I didn't find a date on this, but 2009 they released The Silence of Forgotten Landscapes, which was a live DVD at uh, Bebop Club in Vosselier, Vosselar, Belgium. Uh, came out on Shiver Records. And uh, was there one more here then? And then, yeah, the Compendium Archive came out, which is a compilation of 96 through 06 uh, tracks, demos, uh, pillow, pillow tracks, and unreleased tracks, sold exclusively at the two uh, shows that they, two gigs in 2010 that they did. Um, that was 250 hand numbered copies, and that came out by Liet van Dammering. You know how that one, Jimmy? No? All right. Um, Marrow of the Spirit came out November 23rd, 2010 on... Uh, this is on... Who's this on? Profound Lore? Yeah, Profound Lore. Profound Lore, right. So, um, well, you got that just on CD, Jimmy? You're muted, right? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have this one on uh, vinyl. Um they really need to repress this at some point, but uh, yeah, I don't. You, want it on vinyl, you gotta pay like two hundred bucks. Wait for CD or for the album? You mean album for the for the vinyl? Oh, um, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think too. I think this is the first one that they haven't remastered yet, which probably goes hand in hand with you know having not re-released it. I think they yeah is good enough to stand on its own, but that's probably why there's no. This was released. Uh, this was produced by Stephen Lobdell. I believe is that right, Stephen Ray Lobdell, and was recorded at Audible Alchemy in Portland. And um, I'm going to let you go first on this one, Ryan, because I have a feeling you have some stuff to say about this one. 
Nice, yeah. Jimmy. Yes, I do. So actually, this is not my favorite. Oh. I, I have an even weirder favorite Agalock release. But wow. Interesting. Yes. I yeah. do. There's only really one more, isn't there? Uh, well, no, two. Not quite. Two. Not well, that's quite. what I mean. That's why okay. it's like no one, no one will guess it. It won't okay. be anyone's like first five guesses. I've guessed okay. it. I guess so it's, Fal probably, it's gotta probably be Falcon. It um anyway, I love this record. Uh this was my first exposure to Agalock. I had never heard any metal like this ever. And I mean, still to this day, like I, you know, I still find myself Googling bands who sound like Agalock and they don't yeah. exist. There's nothing. Um, Agreed. there are bands who do explicitly try to do this style, but I just don't think anyone can nail it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this is a really, really unique one. I think maybe it's their most depressive. Um, for me, it's, it's this or the mantle or, uh, marrow. No, sorry. It's marrow of the spirit or the mantle for their most like overall depressing record in my opinion. But I think this one takes the cake. This one's really dark, especially with the piano in the intro and outro or, or sorry, the violin in the intro and outro. Um, something about that just, just gets me. It is, it is so powerful. Um, also I think black Lake Neath song is their second longest song. Um, this is a really dense record, like six tracks and like, I think it's over an hour long. Um, that's a lot of music. Yeah, it's over an hour long. Yeah. So, I mean, they just have a, an intro and then five long as fuck songs. And, um, you know, by this point in their career, they're able to pull these these songs off with with ample success. So there's there's no concerns there. But um, let's see, do I have anything else? Yeah, I just think I think honestly, the the highlight for me is this the the album art used to be my uh, cover photo on Facebook. Like that's how that's how big this record was for me. Um, and I think it kind of opened the doors for me into this more like you know just atmospheric black metal in general. Because um, I, I I find this to be a very black metal record. Um, and the the lyrics i remember sitting down and reading the lyrics 2010 so i was like a junior in high school and i sat down and read the lyrics and i like i was just floored because i didn't realize that people took metal this seriously and like used it as a real vehicle to like express you know like a wide range of emotions and like deal with really like weighty topics um I, I mean, this this was just a gateway for me in a lot of important ways. And while it's not my favorite Agalock release, it is such an important record for me. And I will never, ever stop saying good things about it. And also, the album art is just amazing. It is probably my favorite Agalock album art. I can definitely say that. Um, yes, the end of to, yes, the end of To Drown is like a out-of-body experience. It is, it is just such a good record. Um, I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say on this one. Okay, uh, Logan, we'll hit you on this one. All right, so this one was a little, it, uh, I kind of, it was kind of lost between the cracks for me when I got into this band because I got into them with 2012, and I think the end was, you know, consistently repressing all of their releases and stuff, you know, and as uh, Jimmy mentioned. It's, and as Ryan also mentioned, it's not probably going to get a repress for the most part. So this was the last Agalock album I heard. Like, it, I mean, after Serpent in the Sphere and all. So, and I didn't pick this up probably until like 2018, 2019. And in total, probably given it about less than 10 listens in total. So this is the the one that I'm the newest with but there is a lot to unpack here and mm -hmm. I'm really excited to be in the middle of unpacking it if you will you know like I'm definitely not right. my opinion is not fully formed on what this is and where it stands like I can definitely for this vid the sake of this stream put it in a place but I don't know if that's where it would potentially end up landing, but right. there's just there's just a lot going on. And I, I think in order to kind of like think about this this album, you have to once again revisit the concept of drummers in Agalock. Here we go. Oh shit. There it is. Aesop Decker from this band, Ludicra, 
jumps in, and I think he makes Agalok an extreme metal band for the first time in their career on this release. This stuff yes. is heavier. It's darker. It it will swing back and forth from the regular like dynamics of Agalok, but instead of swinging into like a more fast paced like Agalok, which is actually more like mid paced black metal. Like let's just right yep. say it as it is. Agalok that's, that's never well put, that's well put. Yeah, Agalok never was like no nope. you know, immortal behind in black metal. Yeah, this isn't but, dark fun- dark funeral or, or no, but or pure holocaust or something. Aesop Decker helped give him that push towards that actual extreme black metal sound. And I think it gave them the confidence. And maybe that's why the guy who was on drums for this one only was there for the one album. They weren't, that's not what they wanted. It's not what John wanted to do. Maybe John wanted to go down a more extreme heavy route. But the story I read was that he mm-hmm. was not really Ex, he was not really uh, improving as a live drummer, and then they felt that he just wasn't he, what you just said. He just he wasn't cutting it. Yeah, I mean, Aesop is the opposite of that. The dude is good, phenomenal. Like, yep. and he he shows off. Honestly, he doesn't show off as much on this album as he will on maybe the, the potentially the next one. But yeah, this is. An extreme metal band, I I think, or like they're they're more on that black metal tilt. It sounds like to me. Uh, I will say, I mean, into the painted gray is just it's just absolutely epic. It's got like such a great interplay between the blast beat sections and the clean guitar sections. Uh, I think my favorite song is Black Lake Nidstein. How do you say that? Yeah, need stung. Need, need nice stung. stung. Yeah. Nice stung, yeah. <laughs> so nice stung. Oh, okay, really quick. If yeah. you don't know what that is, it's worth explaining. Please. So in Icelandic culture, and and what's interesting to me is how major Norse culture is on this band. Um so a need stung is is a cursing pole. So you you decapitate a horse and you put the horse's head on a pole and you face it towards your neighbor's house. And that's that's like putting a curse on their household. So the Black Lake Neatstong was one of those that they found in Iceland, I think, in like a area called Black Lake or something like that. No kidding! Wow, how about that? It's very Summerlandish. Yes. What, I mean, Som- what's that called? Was that movie called Summerland or Summerland? Right. So, uh, Midsummer. Midsummer. No, Midsummer. Yeah, that's yeah, Midsummer. It. Midsummer. Yes, it Midsummer. Yeah. Just very, very uh, pagan and. Mm-hmm kind of fucked up that you'd cut a head off a horse and hang it and face it yeah it's pretty primitive right go ahead logan oh okay yeah that's that's cool and i i will have to listen to that with this that song again with that in mind but to me the best part of that song is where it'll like it ends with like some ambience and then just builds back up and amps back up from there and the drums just sound absolutely crushing towards the end of that song, you know? Uh, and then to drown, I think someone in the comments mentioned how it was transcendental. I, I absolutely agree. It's to me, Black Lake, this not staying or sorry, <laughs> Brian, whatever, whatever you said in to drown are the two best songs on this album. And, I'm just excited to see where this falls. You know, like right now, I would say it's hovering at like a strong eight to a nine. I don't want to say, I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave it there. But excited to explore more. All right, Jimmy. I know you have a couple thoughts on this one. Yeah. um, Well, I mean, at this point, in the uh, trajectory of uh, being a fan of the band, I was anticipating this record, like, I mean, more so than any other record I've been looking forward to, you know, because like you have to wait for like four years for a new Agalock record. And, uh, you know, so what? 2007, right? It was uh, Ashes. And then, you know, of course, you know, the white, 
Yeah, I think I remember like being like the biggest Megadeth fan when I was huge into Rust in Peace and like anticipating uh, Countdown to Extinction. And uh, like I walked into the record store the day that it came out and, you know, bought it and was, yeah, unfortunately kind of uh, disappointed because I held that record in such high regard that like, you know, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought it was at the time. And it's actually a decent record. Um I was so, so excited for this. Um, and, uh, who, I mean, I don't know. I say, I sense a butt coming. Well, I mean, not really. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I do like this record. I think it's a good record. Um, I think I don't, I, I didn't feel like it was a step in the right direction for them because I definitely felt like it was the first time where it was like, okay, they're not like uh, gods anymore. They're just humans like that are just figuring it out, whatever. You, know, you I'm sure you guys have records like that where you feel like these guys are just fucking gods. They're, you know, they're, uh, you know, elevated humans at their ability to create music that uh, is, is, you know, uh, blows your mind. Um, so I, I, I found it very interesting that they went, in more of a, a black metal, you know, uh, direction. And that was pretty evident before the record was released is that they were kind of, you know, changing things up, new drummer, um, you know, four years at this point also, you know, they're, they're pretty known. They're pretty big. Right. I mean, like, Good uh, point. You know, everybody knows who the fuck they are. I mean, like they're not they, all of a sudden, maybe they have something to prove, you know, like, Whereas like previous releases like that, you know, their, their appeal didn't really matter. Like it was right. That's a great like, point. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, so, you know, at this point, I think after ashes, they had started playing live a lot more. Um, so uh, got Aesop on drums and <clears throat> I think this is a really good record. I, I, I really enjoy it. Um, I, I will say, I, you know, I, I'm uber critical you know, when it comes to Agalock. And I thought that uh, I, I definitely, I, I, I cannot stand the production on this thing. I hate the way it sounds. Um, that what do you instantly, hear there? I'm curious. What do you hear there? I'm just curious. It's just, it's just I mean, like, I think it, I, I kind of understand like what they were going for. Like, I think they wanted to get a little more abrasive. I think they wanted to get a little more, you know, I don't want to say that they wanted to get more like metal cred. I I don't want to like put them on that. You know, I want to put that on them, but I, I feel like they were just, you know, they had a lot to prove for sure. I mean, there was a lot of hype, a lot of, uh, you know, focus on the band at this point. And I think that was probably kind of hard for them, you know, cause they're not the type of guys that were, you know, um, you know, expecting super, that super sort of media savvy. Yeah. Super media. Yeah. Savvy you know, and, 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 uh, you know, so at this point they're playing live, they're doing those things. And, um, so, um, I think I thought it was cool that they had more of a focus on, you know, like, uh, you know, more, a more metal cred here, like a more, you know, a heavier kind of thing. Um, but I, and I think that they chose the production to suit that, you know, I, I think they wanted to go for more something different. And, uh, you know, I, I don't fault them for that, whatever. I, I, I don't think it really quite worked for them. Um, you know, for me, at least uh, it, it's too, uh, it's too abrasive. It's too tinny sounding, you know, I mean, uh, it's too like kind of trying to go for that sort of thing rather than just do Harsh. what's natural. Well, I, it didn't feel natural to me. It felt like, okay, okay we need to like, kind of, you know, that's just me. That's just what it felt like to me. Now that said, um, I think I was also a little taken aback by, you know, there was a lot of, um, guest musicians on this, you know, when there the, was, you know, and I was kind of taken aback by that because it was like, you guys don't need guest musicians. You can do everything, you know? I mean, how many, you know, different instruments did we hear like on the previous records? <clears throat> To me, that felt like a little forced, like it was a little like, you know, not as honest as I've always felt about this band, you know, so not that it's a bad thing because, you know, the intro track is great. I, I like uh, what uh, the Chalice did with that. Um, but going into 
especially into the painted gray is where I start to really have problems because I felt like, okay, this just feels like it's, it's unmistakably Agaloc, but it's, you know, they're going for the blast beat thing. They've got Aesop in the band now and Aesop sounds great. A great drummer to, to add to the band. Um, but I don't know. It just, I don't know. It's, it just, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't quite, you know, add up for me. And then uh, I think the Watchers Monolith was the first track that they released uh, leading up to the, to the record release. And that one kind of harkens a little bit more back to like what they do, you know, whereas into the paint of the gray was kind of more, you know, the abrasive black metal song. Yeah, like, for sure. It just felt like they're like, we're doing our black metal moment here. And I just always felt like you don't have to do that. Just do what's natural. And, uh, and that's just, you know, it's a very, you know, complete fanboy gripe because, you know, if, if you take my gripes aside, this is a good record for sure. And, uh, I would I would definitely say that uh, black black like uh, night sting however you pronounce it I mean that's that's an example of a band that really knows how to write songs again you know it's a tw it's a twenty minute track or whatever and it ebbs and flows perfectly uh, I mean not a, not a moment to be missed on that song um, I would say like for me like the back half of this album shines you know with Black Lake and Ghosts of the Midwinter Fires. That could have been off, you know, the mantle. Great yeah. track. Great, you know, still building upon what they're good at. You know, good good songwriting. And to Drown, even though that has a lot of, like, guests, I mean, that's a really wonderful, uh, just, man, abrasive, you know, yet uh, classic. Very, ex very experimental. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, like, you know, in retrospect, uh, I was a little disappointed, but it's still – um it's still up to the standard to i expect from this band um but just missing the mark a little bit um and i think the production really kind of you know in a lot of places kind of ruins it for me and i i you don't have to do blast beats man you know i mean like it's cool and and it works but you know i almost i, I just feel like it it feels forced you know, it feels well, like that's a good point. Where are we gonna go? Like, we gotta really like make this next big epic album, and I don't know. It just, you know, be a live band, maybe. I don't know, uh, which is cool. Um, but don't get me wrong; it's still a really great record. Um, I like it a lot. It just missed the mark a little bit for me, and I wasn't really sure where they were going at this point. Yeah, I, I really, I really, Jimmy, I really get what you're saying about that, honestly. Like, and it's a great album, and I still don't like it's either a strong eight or a light nine. It's like kind of in that area, but I think it highlights for me. I don't know if I necessarily like Aesop being in Agalock, honestly. Like, I might prefer John Ham, honestly, just because of how the drumming was so much more focused on the individual songs and crafting like the, the post rock kind of feel and that ebb and flow where Aesop is just like, he kind of just takes over. He's just like, look at this, you know, or, and we'll, we'll get into it. I'll mm. touch on it a little bit yeah. more here, but that's good. Yeah. It's hey. a lot more. Hey, I'm Aesop. Um, Jeff, I got to hop off. Is it cool if I get some closing thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll cool. jump over to you real quick. Go All ahead. Right. Sorry to interrupt you because I know it's your turn, but I'll just I'll be real cool. quick. So actually, this this uh, dovetails off of what Logan was just saying because I really do like Aesop in this band, and <laughs> because Mirror of the Spirit was my introduction to Agaloc, obviously, I feel like it actually gave me a way to appreciate their future output and their previous output. Right. Um, I kind of like found the band in that sweet spot. Uh, so what I will say is I know this record and The Serpent and the Sphere are their most contentious releases. Some people just outright hate them. I love them both. Um, I think Serpent and the Sphere is an incredible release. Um, it's it's very heavy. It's a lot more like metal, I think, than a lot of it's their, their It's their doom metal album for yes, me. Yes, definitely. Yeah. But I mean, I love it. The like neoclassical like interlude tracks on that record are some of my favorite like which movies. i don't think he plays i think the other guy plays right the um, yes yes yeah so, like it, it, they're literally neoclassical guitar pieces like they're yeah incredibly composed. Matt, 
Nathaniel Lachere or Lachera yes. or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I sat down and tried to learn those. They're tough. Like that's like some serious musicianship. Let me, let me throw one thing at you here about yeah. that album. See if yeah. you agree. I'm gonna blow myself up. Rick said this today, and I think he fucking nailed it. The serpent tells you where John's gonna go with Pelorian. Yeah. No, I hear that 100. percent Yes, 100. percent Yeah. And because maybe that's it definitely. It's definitely there. That more doomier, yes. maybe a slightly bit more riff heavy, sludgier, yeah. polarian vibe. Yeah. Like angrier, I would say. Oh yeah. Like, there's some aggression on those on and super Polarian. fucking dark. Super yeah. dark on a yeah. couple of those tracks. So go ahead. Yeah. So I, I love that record. Astral Dialogue is one of my favorite Agalock songs. Um but yeah, I'm really curious to hear what you guys say about that one. But let me uh close off with with a bang here because Faustian Echoes is my favorite Agalock release ever. Ah, ever. Nice, nice. Period. I fucking love it. There was a there was a point in college where I listened to this song every day for like a month straight. And I mean, it's like a 24 minute song. I cannot get over how good this song is. Um, it's definitely, definitely their most traditional black metal track. Yep. Um, I think they've ever done. It is just black metal. Like there's obviously like, uh, you know, clean guitar portions but like it's just a black metal song um but for me what really did it is the the theme which is obviously the faust story um but the way that they handled that that lyrical content is just like sublime it is so is so well done the samples in that song are from a movie that i actually watched where they they recreate the faust story with like puppets it's really it's like a fever dream it's a weird movie but they use the samples. I mean, I get chills at the end of that song when that last sample uh, just kind of fades in. Like, I get chills. I'm getting chills thinking about it. Like, it is it is perfect, perfect music. Probably one of my favorite songs ever. Um, I I love it so much. So I, I feel like it definitely falls into, like, the, the you know, the second half of Agalock's career with with Marrow onward because um, it's definitely just more of a metal song. And, like, like, like you guys were saying, Aesop kind of seemed to, like, I guess you know, set the ground for them to, to explore these more extreme metal ideas that maybe they, they wanted to, to get into. Um, that's definitely something you see on this release. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll wrap it up there. It is one of my favorite songs of all time. And it, and no one ever, ever expects that to be your favorite Agalos, Agalock record, but that's it for me. Yeah. I, I nice. said it, I, I jumped on it, but I, I would not have expected that at all. I would not <laughs> That would have been probably the last one I would have thought for most. Although Eli, who was supposed to join us tonight, that I think might be his favorite. So, um, wow. yeah, I, um, about that. yeah, bail, bail out. And if you get a chance to watch the end, uh, we'll probably, oh. we've got maybe 15, 20 more minutes or so here, maybe a little yeah, bit absolutely. more. And then we'll be wrapping it up too. I was worried awesome. we weren't going to get this done. Now we didn't, we lost a guy too, but I was yeah. worried we weren't going to get this done in five hours, but we're doing well. So thanks for joining yeah, me, Ryan. I really appreciate it, man. Of course, man. Your, this was your input was, I, was awesome, dude. Definitely. And I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about these last couple of releases. Yeah, Ryan, Hi, man. good to meet you, man. Yeah, great meeting you. And uh, have a good night, guys. Um, Cheers, man. Thanks, yeah, this, was, this was a lot of fun. For sure. All right. See you, brother. Right. Later. See you. Okay. So where were – oh, we were at Marrow, I think. Or Jimmy, were you done with Marrow? Okay. So at Marrow, I'm going to throw some quick stuff out, and then we'll hit Faustian and wrap up with Serpent and call it a night. Um, I, you know, Jimmy, you and I were talking about this a little bit. You were saying about the production, and I was I was trying to hear what you were hearing. And that, you know, we all hear differently. We all hear and approach music differently. And the one thing I think I do hear a little bit of is that, it, like you said, it's a little harsher. Tinny, you brought up Tinny. I hear that. There's a little bit more high end to this album than in the past because they always were good at adept at having that acoustic range where you are in the mid tones a lot. You know what I mean? And um, this one kind of gets a little bit more harsher on the ears, I guess. But I do like it quite a bit. I really, really do. It's, I mean, maybe a better mastering job on this would have been would have really so a remaster on this one probably is definitely something that hopefully they are looking to do at some point um 
But they escaped the weight of darkness intro, you know, the piano. It's cool. I think it goes on a little long for me, just a tad. I don't know why. It just seems to go on a little long. Into the Painted Gray, lots and lots of black metal vocals. Like you said, this is their token. Look at us. We can be super black metal, and we have a blast beat drummer now. And I like it. I don't dislike it. It's solid. It's very good. It's just not really what they've done, typically. Um, the, the Watcher's Monolith, man, I really like that track. I really like it, man. That's more typical Agaloc. You know, that's the one that you would go, oh, what's the song there? It sounds most like older Agaloc. That's the one. Black, Nate, yeah. Ni Black Lake Neistang. Um, yeah, that, that is, that's a, a roller coaster ride sort of setting us up for the next EP. Um, it's very, to me, it reminds me quite a bit, although it goes into that really cool ambient, almost tangerine dreamish section, love which it. is super fucking cool. Cause I, so you know, good. I love tangerine dream mm -hmm. and it's really cool. You're getting almost those sequenced and I can't tell, I was struggling to tell whether it was guitar that was sequenced that he did those notes and they're just on delay and then he sequenced it in or whether it's a synth, it kind of sounds it could be MIDI guitar. It could be MIDI synth. I mean, it's hard to tell, but it's so, so tell. cool. Yeah, yeah it's really so cool. cool. Um, so Black Knight, Lake Neistang, really fucking badass song. Ghost of Midwinter Fires, great song. It's more black uh, more black metal, but it's a little more Agaloc black metal style. Um, still very post-metal, too, on that one. There's still a lot of post-metal. And then To Drown, that's probably the most unique song on the album. It's um, yeah. really cool. It, it's... It's something they've never done before, and it builds and builds, and it kind of, it kind of becomes a wall of noise sort of song to a degree. But like uh, Pedro says here, I associate. Oh no, I'm sorry. The end of your drown is transcendental. Exactly. It's kind of like it you have this almost out of body experience when you're listening to it. You're like, if you really focus on it and close your eyes, you can feel yourself like astrally projecting or something like that. It's yeah, so, that ending is yeah, it's yeah. so cool. So for me, this is a strong eight out of 10. And the only reason I, I don't have so much the issue with Aesop's drumming. I just think that it, it sounds a little harsh, like you've mentioned. So yeah. I, we did hear something similar. That's the only thing that to my ears was, a, a, it just didn't have that. Also, I don't think there's as much acoustic on that album as generally he was used to playing. So yeah, they're um, kind of missing uh, Hans' uh, clean vocals too. There's not a whole lot of clean. Yeah, there wasn't much clean. There's a couple. On, there's right. a couple. There's a couple. Think, yeah, but not much. No. But I've no. been very critical of the record, but it's still a great record. Don't get me wrong. And that, yeah, I that's mean, the thing. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, even their worst record is still a pretty good record. You yeah. know, I mean, it, it really is. There's there's a lot a lot to that. So, all right. So we get to um, shit. Where's it at? Oh, you're Echoes. kidding me. Yeah, but I didn't write down the date. Fuck. Uh, it's 2012. Uh, 2012? It's, I can get the exact date for you in a second if you want it. Okay, 20. yeah, 2012. That's right. Um, yeah, it's... They come out with Faustian, Epo, Ep, ah, Faustian Echoes, which is a 21-minute, 34-second track. Um, yeah, came out June 2012. June 2012. Okay, cool. Came out as an EP. Um, I, it was released digitally at first, then a CD vinyl uh, at shows, and then via email order exclusively. Do you have this? Does anybody have this? That's the you only one I don't have a physical. Nope. Yeah. Nope. What do they go for on? Uh, what do they go on? Uh, well, they've got uh, um, Eisenwald on, has copies of it. Yeah. I almost added that in my uh, order with the White Album, but oh, they do have it. They make it like. 40 bucks for two CDs, so nope. <laughs> okay. Um, well, where's Eisenwald coming from? Is that in Germany or Dutch? I think it's... Oh, I'm shit, sure. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I paid U.S. shipping. I only paid six dollars. They, have, oh, a okay. they, more, so. they have a U.S. They, distro there. Yeah. Okay. Right. I only paid six dollars for shipping. So. Um, so this one, this is a much darker black metal style on this one. Um, the dialogue from the movie, the vocals are super gnarly on this. I mean, this is by far John's yeah. most snarling vocals by far. Yeah. Um, intense is, what do I have here? It's a pretty killer track. Uh, what do I, 
some of the some of the line levels seem a little odd to me at times though on the in the transitions that's the only uh a thing i would probably criticize at all the vocals are really really intense um oh it was the 94 film faust where the samples come from by um i can't read this guy's name i don't know who did it you guys know the movie Oh, yeah. uh, Ryan yeah. knows. <laughs> yeah, Ryan would know. Something's, I can't read my writing, so sorry about that. By this time, I was getting pretty tired. The, the cover artwork, interesting to note, Salvador Dali um, from Goeth's Faust, and I can't read the guy's name. I don't know. Anyway, um, I dig this one, man. It's pretty fucking cool, um, and it's, it's pretty harsh, man. I mean, this is probably, I would say, their most black metal song of all. Uh, but it still incorporates a lot of the Agalakian stuff, you know that that you come to you come to know. Um, so th this is good shit, man. Really good shit. That's all I got on Jimmy. Yeah, I actually uh, don't have too much on this one. Um, I listened to it once this week, and I kind of, you know, glossed over it back in the day, and. Um, I definitely liked it. I don't know. It, it, I was surprised to hear Ryan, you know, say that it was his favorite. Um, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say I'm totally surprised knowing Ryan uh, as I do, but because um, it kind of makes sense to me knowing him uh, that. But um, I don't know. I, I really feel like I need to revisit this one. I definitely liked it a lot. I felt like it was like, you know, like most Agalock EPs, like they kind of like are kind of, I don't want to say left over, but like just more stuff that they had done at the time that didn't really quite fit the full length and um right this is kind of different this one's yeah. a little different though it, this it's, feels it unique is. to me it is and it's very, very self-contained track yeah and i think they like kind of took advantage of the fact that they had aesop on drums and kind of oh, made sure. like a big black metal show like kind of like what they were trying to do at marrow um but um i i definitely feel like uh inspired to go listen to it some more because uh honestly out of all the Agalock uh, catalog, this is the, the one I'm least familiar with. So, uh, but I will say that when I did listen to it, I thought it was good. I just, it didn't grab me like most Agalock stuff does, you know? Well, you probably also didn't, you know, have the time to really digest it. You know, that's, yeah. If you'd had six or seven listens or whatever, you would have probably been able to go, okay, I can, I got a better, informed way of, of going about this but yeah i mean um yeah ryan no problem dude i really really appreciated you joining tonight honestly Let's i had a bad see. taste in my mouth after marrow i mean yeah. as much as i like marrow i was struggling you know, still struggling yeah. a little bit with the band yeah. as a whole yeah um how about you ryan, uh ryan i was gonna call you ryan again <laughs> logan and uh, i'm the one that's not drinking at all <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to you, Jeff. Yeah, uh, so this one is actually like this the second Agalock album I heard after Pale Folklore because 2012. So this right, right around it's the right time in your I, sweet I, spot, right? Right, yeah. So I I definitely value this one pretty highly. I if I think I were to rank it, it would probably be right below the first three full lengths, and then wow, nice. It's yeah, it's. It's pretty awesome. I think the, the biggest part of it is just because of the overall concept and how it's so well contained in this one track and the samples that they use are almost like a another instrument. They add it the samples add so much depth and so much more impact to the music as you're listening to it. And I think because of the subject matter and because of the Faustian story and what it's conveying the extremity of the music and the fact that they're going as heavy into the black metal and into blast beats and stuff and into the contrast between like blast beats and then oh here's a sample or blast beats and here's a clean guitar break it just it just fits better i think because mm. of the, the overall concept that they're conveying you know and like I still think there's like beautiful guitar parts in the song, like seven oh, there minutes is. in. There's like a crazy, cool riff change that uh, is just a clean guitar lead that plays out, which is just immediately 
hooks in your brain. Uh, and then it kind of s- sticks or it ventures into doom territory as well. Like towards the middle of the album, it gets, it kind of slows down a little bit, but picks right back up on the blast beats. And then just overall the, the sound clips, like, like the, especially the one at the very end where it's like, it's, uh, I guess it's Faust and uh, Ryan could probably actually explain this better than I could, but he was like, it sounds like Faust and like the devil arguing where, the devil's basically saying that there's no there's no weight or there's no actual tangibility to feelings and emotions and stuff like that that you know it's just words there's no actual reality to you know to feelings essentially and then faust is like well then if if anger and sadness and depression and stuff if, if all that is words and all that is meaningless if all that is nothing then ma- mankind is essentially nothing as well and then it just ends after that and i don't know it's just it was a very cool ending to a cool song cool ep so i don't know, definitely rank it highly yeah i'm i'm like uh Honestly, I'm like Jimmy. This is the one I've had the least amount of time with, other than Serpent, which I just got mm-hmm. into the last two days. So I got maybe three or four listens in on this one. So not enough for me to go, oh, I really know this like the back of my hand. All the other ones, even Marrow, when I fired it up, I had had that back in the you know when that came out and listened yeah. to it a lot. So I, I, I recognized some melodies and some vocal lines and stuff, but this one was, was wholly new to me. I remember you said this came out in 12, right? Yeah. I remember echoes did. Yeah. Yeah. I remember this coming out and I gotta be honest with you after marrow. And it's interesting, Jimmy, because you and I have maybe a similar experience, but maybe for different reasons, I gotta be blunt with you at 2012. Now I'd been into this band for the better part of a decade. And while they had not let me down at all in any way, shape, or form, I think I was start. Some of my tastes were changing a little bit, um, and I was starting to listen to. Oh, with re- regards to metal, I was starting to get into more old school death metal that I had missed. You know, some of the more brutal knuckle dragging stuff. So, some of this more crystalline, pretty stuff, or these long track. For example, these long tracks, because this is almost 22 minutes, Mm -hmm. you know, which is like the length of fucking, you know, close to the edge or, you know, something like that. It wasn't it wasn't as in my wheelhouse. And I I I don't even recall listening to this when it came out. So it, it may have completely excuse me, may have completely passed me by. And. So when I listened to it on Wednesday and then again yesterday, I was like, oh, okay, this is pretty good, man. I mean, like, I, I don't think I was expecting it to be good. And then based on kind of talking to Jimmy about the last album, which I didn't, I knew it came out, but I never picked up, never even listened to. I was like, well, I wonder if the last album is better than I think it's going to be. And we'll get that in a minute. But yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. I give it a seven and a half out of 10. And that's just because I'm just not like you, Jimmy. I've got a few more listens than you under my belt, but I just, I don't have, I don't have enough experience with it. And no, Kevin, I haven't seen them. I don't think, I don't think anyone else um, was. I've seen them uh, three times. Yeah, I, I've not seen them live. They came to a fest in DC. I don't remember whether it was Decibel, if that was around then or. <laughs> But I know I was I was supposed to go. My buddy John was lived down there. I was gonna crash at his place. And I know also that fucking um oh uh, November's Doom was playing too. I was like super stoked. And then something happened. I think to be honest with you, I hate to say this. I well wait a minute, this would have been yeah, this would have been in yeah, around two thousand four ish, two thousand when did they go out first? Was it 2000 for they went out for Pale Folklore, right? Or not Pale Folklore, um, the Mantle, right? Yeah, they went out touring finally for the Mantle, right? I think. 
don't think they'd start a tournament. It probably wasn't until, until they got the drummer, the drummer, right? Yeah. Well, At least Ashes Against the Grain, because that's when they got the drummer. Yeah, but that was all the way at 2006. Are you sure mm -hmm. it was that far? I don't remember it being that far up. Well, I mean, they, they did like select shows like in those days, but they didn't really start touring. Well, no, that's what it was. This was just a fest. They weren't on like a major tour. And no, I, I want to say this was 04. And unfortunately, I, you know, built a house in <laughs> from the winter to the summer of 2004. I had two, you know, fairly young kids in fifth grade and third grade or whatever it was. And I moved into that house in 11 days. 11 days, seven days later, my uh, wife came to me and said, Hey, I don't want to be married anymore. So you can imagine I had a little bit of some stress going on in my life at that point, And I you know, was ready to uh, kill everything. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was going to go down to this show and I ended up bailing on it because of what, what was going down. So um, yeah, I, I want to spend a little bit more time with this. I think it is deserving of that. Um, you know, whether I pick it up or not doesn't, really matter but uh how about we jump on to the last album guys you ready Let's all right do it. cool jimmy i'm gonna make you talk about this first oh great. <laughs> i wanted to ask uh logan when did you see them play live so i i saw them uh 20 i got i got actually got their set pulled up on setlist fm uh june 27th 2014 oh, nice we're at so it was uh king's barcade in raleigh north carolina uh and i i guess honestly it's it's kind of i'm i'm just so happy that i was able to see them because i'm looking at their set list and i went back their first set was march 6 2003 by the way so that's when they started playing live and they that's what have, i thought 2003 yep yeah they don't have as much like they i guess they did not play live too much you know no so, they they didn't europe they did they did, uh, I, if I recall correctly, they might have done like two proper U.S. tours with like, um, I don't remember who they were touring with, but um, yeah, they did. Um, by the way, Mariano said Jank Zvang Major, whoever. That's the guy that did the Faust the, movie. The Faust. The album, yeah, but yeah, I, I, it just was weird that for some reason it was just kind of weird that. They they didn't do a whole heck of a lot of touring, and I think it was because, no. to be honest with you, I think you know Don. I was pretty sure was a professor, and he could only tour in the summers, if I recall correctly. And, that's and they had uh, that, June, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to line up their tours so that you know they and they weren't. Let's be honest, they were well known in the U.S. If you were into extreme metal or underground metal, but they weren't going to be selling two thousand tickets to a show. It was going to be you know a couple hundred people max, right? Yeah. The King's Barcade where I saw him was definitely about that. And yeah, honestly, I to me, which if I were to like actually sit and think about it, I don't know if it would hold up with all the shows that I've seen. But the time that I saw them might be my favorite concert ever. They wow. just they they basically set up the venue with so much uh, fog and everything; it was just smoked out, like you could barely yeah. see any of the members at all and they just had flashes of light in the background so it was just like a strobe and you would just see oh, wow. the band flailing around and honestly this is when just seeing aesop decker live was amazing just phenomenal i have this super distinct memory of watching the ending of falling snow you know where they're breaking it down and it's just flashing lights pure fog and you're just seeing these silhouettes of these guys just going oh, ham wow. on their instruments as it's the that song is just breaking itself down <clears throat> that must have been great yeah it was, well, look at that yeah lucky you man I, I mean i never got to see him i know best, best live experience for me I, I know that when the band broke up um they uh Pelorian went out pretty quickly they went out and i don't remember who they were that. playing with yeah they, they were played playing in raleigh with, too well, they played Baltimore, and once again, something came up at the last second, and I didn't go. Which so you know, all right, Jimmy, give us your thoughts on the. Serpent. Yeah, I saw them. Uh, I saw them the first time for me was uh, 2012. Um, after on the you know when they first started touring. Oh yeah. Um, I saw them in Denver on the Marathon Spirit tour, and they were just sublime, amazing. Um, I saw them two more times on the uh, the Serpent and the Sphere tour. 
you know, which would have been the end. And, uh, you know, kind of a perfect segue into talking about this album. Um, I don't have this on vinyl. It's just a CD. Uh, at some point, if it gets a vinyl re-release, I'll probably pick it up. But um, And that came out May 13th, uh, 2014. 2014, yeah. Yeah, uh, that was on Profound Lore again. It was produced by Billy Anderson. So go ahead, man. Yeah. Um, I've been uh, uber critical of this record for many years, you know, since, since it came out uh, because, you know, this is one of my favorite bands of all time and, uh, you know, I've written some of my favorite albums of all time. And, uh, you know, honestly, when this came out, I, I fucking hated it. I thought it's, wow. um, you know, it, it just, to me, it felt like they phoned it all in. They, but then I had to like take a step back and like really listen to it and like get over my own like kind of misgivings about the band, you know, given that, you know, like Marrow of the Spirit, I really liked, but I had a lot of problems with it. And over time, like I kind of overcame those problems. And uh, <clears throat> I definitely don't want to come off as, you know, like some kind of fucking Nazi prick that thinks that, you know, everything sucks or anything, you know, but like when it comes to your favorite band, you have to be kind of critical. Um you know, when something they do comes out and it's just, you know, I, I realize these guys are human and like, they're not, uh, you know, perfect. And, you know, a lot of people think this is a perfect record. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to like take any enjoyment away from this, this album that people have. And, um, you know, ever since it came out in 2014, like I've, I've, I've gone back to it, I think almost every year, like I go back to it and try to see like where I sit with it. And, um, I've done that so many times and I feel like over the years, like it never really changed for me. Um, maybe until recently and, and, and it hasn't really changed a whole lot, but what I will say is that like, you know, instantly like, like listening to it, I think, uh, you know, they kind of corrected some problems. I think they had with Mara of the spirit, largely the production. I think the production is fantastic. It sounds really good. You know, I feel like they kind of went back to what they were good at, you know, in terms of like their sound, like it, it, it didn't feel to me like they were trying to like, you know, not to say that they were trying to be a black metal band or whatever it was on Mare of the Spirit. I don't want to say that, but it just kind of felt that way to me listening to it, that it, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was natural anymore. Like it felt like they were trying to figure out something to we need to put out a record. Let's put this out. And here it is. And, you know, even though like there was a lot of great, great stuff on Mare of the Spirit, but on this one, it really even felt like that more so, um, you know, because again, it's another four year rate for uh, the Serpent and Sphere. Um, but uh, I think, you know, probably what kind of jaded me about this record is seeing them live. I saw them live twice on, on this record. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And honestly, like, I felt like the songs on here just, I don't know. They just didn't, didn't feel, translate. Didn't no, translate. Like, wrong. I mean, like, like, I feel like it was them for sure. Um, but it just didn't feel to me like, um, uh, you know, um, you know, for example, you know, they started off with birth and death of the pillars of the of creation, which is a really good song. And it really oh, yeah. has that good, good build and good like i mean the sound is good like right off the bat like i mean it sounds amazing um i had i had some problems with the fact that they you know i love uh the guy from Mus muskox that does the interludes like fantastic oh, contributions yeah. i love the interludes but i couldn't help but feel like man y'all had to hire somebody to do that why didn't you guys just do it yourself i mean like y'all are i mean you're the best at doing that kind of stuff and you had to bring somebody out. Okay. That's fine. It's, it's, it's a stupid gripe, you know, fanboy gripe that I have, but I just, it bothered me that they couldn't just handle that themselves and not have to, it just, it, it spoke to me in saying like you had to bring somebody in to, you know, kind of bridge things together and um, you know, maybe I'm full well, of shit, you know, it's just my I own gripe. Um, can I interject a thought there, though? Sure. Mm -hmm. So as a guitar player, one thing I will say is that playing classical guitar is quite a bit different from playing acoustic guitar. And in other, as far as recording, 
Sure. Be because you really got to be pretty damn precise. And maybe John just didn't feel his chops were good enough on the classical side to pull them off, whereas he's great on the steel string, not the nylon string. Right, nylon string's I mean, a lot less forgiving. Right, but did they write those songs, or was that uh, just – Well, hey, that's, come, a, that, that's a good hey, question. Man, I come in and do some cool acoustic interludes – you know, well, to, you to, have the you yeah. have the CD there. Look on the CD. I don't well, know. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I could. Um, but well, let me finish real quick. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And and so, I mean, there's a lot to like on this this record. I mean, it's kind of like classic Agalog. It's kind of back to what we want to hear from them, you know. And like, I just feel like the songs, like when we get into like Dark Matter Gods and Celestial Effigy, uh, the Astral Dialogue. All, I mean they're decent songs. I just feel like there's something missing. Like it's not the compositional genius that we've heard like previously, you know, like, I mean, I feel like they had some good ideas, but they weren't really fully fleshed out. And mind you, like I said, being uber critical, uh, but like, especially when it comes to veils beyond dimension, which is like, again, like there's some good, good ideas there, but it just, feels like mm -hmm. weird and it does especially when they played it live it just didn't work for me i mean uh and plateau of the ages which is like the big epic you know closing track starts great and it's got some great ideas but i felt like they they became like a victim of repeating themselves whereas like previously on on other albums where like the song would you know it's kind of the same thing but they would build and they would do it in a way that worked i i felt like it didn't work here and um you know i i know a lot of people love this record um but i i've tried and tried again and i just feel like they lost it at this point and wow. and, and i gotta tell you like the last time we saw them live me and my wife is a huge fan of this band one of the only you know bands that me and my wife agree on um you know seeing them play live uh that last time it was the end of the the u.s tour the last mm -hmm. tour they did and, what till, uh, what year was this 15 16 it was like 15 yeah. 14? okay and, 15. Um, i gotta i gotta be honest man you could feel it you could feel that they were just it just was not the same it just well were not we'll talk about together. that yeah i, mean, I think there was songs. some tension i think there was tension in the band though yeah that had been building for a while was. and i mean and, and that was obvious but i just felt like that bleeded into these songs you know, yeah, it just, it just, it's, it's not a bad record. It's still a good record. It just, it's, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of having to hold them in such amazingly insane regard that like this just missed the mark. And to me felt like completely like, like they just lost it. Like they, they didn't know how to pull some of these really good <laughs> ideas that are on here. It just fell flat for me, unfortunately. So, you know, I'll bring up the porcupine tree anal analogy where I know you're a big fan of, of fear, but I really started to feel like after the success and amazingness of in, in absentia, which granted was a lot more streamlined for radio to a degree, but also still retained Steve's patented gift for melancholic songwriting and these hooks and lilting british sounding songs he then went and did dead wing which had a lot more progressive stuff and with the exception of two songs on there shallow and and halo which i don't like either of those songs anymore hey uh dead wing has some of the most beautiful songs steve's ever written like mellotron scratch and fucking glass shattering arm and uh half light and you know there's some uh, beastly songs on there when we got to um fear with the exception of anesthetize and sentimental and maybe uh, way out of here, I just, man, that, that album started to turn me a little bit. And by the time we got to the incident, yeah, there's a couple good songs on the incident, but overall I never picked that album up. And I don't know if it was just cause Steve was burnt out. And, you know, as I said to you, Jimmy, John predominantly, who I think is the predominant songwriter overall, John set a really high standard, man. And he almost painted himself into a corner in a lot of ways. Yeah. How well, many times, but how many times could he keep writing 
16, well, 15, 14 minute tracks that well, were the interesting. I mean, like, there's, you know? the moments. there's the moments here, you know, and, and I'm going to make, I'm going to make a really, really awful analogy or maybe okay. it's a good analogy. I don't know, but like, this is the best analogy that I can make about the serpent and sphere. Okay. I don't know if you guys have watched rings of power. Okay. No. But no. Uh, I've okay, heard about right. it. Okay, so like if you're a Tolkien fan, like mo like oh okay, if you're a big fan, if you watch Rings of Power, here's what I'm gonna say: the the actors are fantastic, the visuals are amazing, the concept is there, uh, uh -huh. but the writing is awful. Yeah. Okay, and, huh. and and I don't know if that's a good huh. analogy for this. It's just the best that I can come up with, and I hate to say, and maybe the writing isn't. I mean, look, I mean. That's just my opinion, you know, because I, I was, was going to say maybe you know, a lot of people love this record. You right, know? Like, right. The, but the I've, writing been, I've made... been a fan of this band for so long. And for me, this one, I mean, they lost it, you know, and, and I hate the fact that they went out on this. And I still will say that, it, it. I mean, it's still a good record. I listened to it today and I was like, man, it's not as bad as I have given so much shit to this record. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Yeah, I was wondering. It's really not that bad. It's really, but it just it really just misses the mark for me, you know, as a fan of the band and I look, and it's fine, you know, like, look, these guys are human. Like you can't fucking release a masterpiece every time you come out with a record, you know, it just, but I could definitely, like I said, going back to it, like seeing them live that last time I could feel, I could tell that they were not, they weren't on the same page, you know? Well, that's clear. Um, I don't, feel quite the same way you do and that's we all hear things differently i think yeah. what i do think is that john stripped a lot of these songs back to just the necessary bits and or except for maybe um what's it called the um plateau of ages that's probably the most agalakian old school agalakian song um a lot of the other songs might be what you might call a little bit more simplified as far as riff structure, as far as verse chorus type style. They're more one note for sure. They don't evolve or change. Or... Maybe a little less, maybe a little less dynamic. Maybe yeah. is a good word for it. Um, how about you? Well, the dynamics are still there. Uh, so yeah, I, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I think, Jimmy and I are honestly with this release are toying with a similar issue of just being a very just a big fan of a band and how you cope with when a band Change. potentially is changing and potentially maybe coming off more uninspired or like not necessarily writing what you think they might they should write, you know. Right. I so I think Jimmy's at a more advanced stage. Uh, that when he heard this than I was, right? So for me, this is like came out two years after I first heard of them. So right. I was a lot more in the, I, I want to like this. I need to like this. And this is good because it's Agalock kind of mindset of a fan, right? Which I think you can fall into. And I, I might still be in that because... Like to me, this is still like a light eight out of ten, you know. Like it, I think it's still a great album, and there's a lot of great moments on here. But at the in there are a lot of great songs too. But then at the same time, I'm still able to pick out a lot of issues with it, you know. Like the interlude tracks are like actual interlude tracks, you know. Like they're not the interludes of Aglock before, where it just it was just a seamless, you know, we, we, it led from one to the other. It kind of it kind of takes you out and it makes the album seem very separate, you know. Like there's the the very doom heavy first track, "Birth oh, and yeah. the Death of Pillars of Creation," which is Killer phenomenal. Time. Yep. I and I listened I listened to this one today, as, as I said, and. That one really stood out to me probably the most. Like I think the first when I was listening to it originally, I think I thought that was kind of boring. But I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. Uh, but it really it really made the the interludes not flowing together and really just being like I think if you connected the interludes with each other, 
they would make sense. But within the context of the album, it kind of just takes you out of it, you know? So, like, it goes from birth and death of the pillars of creation, interlude, and then into the astral dialogue. And it just makes the astral dialogue sound very out of place, very much like a an Aesop Decker flex track, you know? Well, like just, how about this? Let me ask you yeah. this. Does that track sound kind of death metal-y to you? The di the Astral Dialogue? Yes. Yeah. It's no, got I mean, a more death metal vibe than anything they've ever done. Well, it's got the fast double bass. So yeah. To me, it's, it's, their, it's their extreme, like, immortal black metal song, you know? That's, yeah, okay. That's good. It's, analogy, so. it's, I mean, it's a good song. I don't, it's a good I don't song. hate it. I, I mean, I like it. It's just, it's not what I would potentially be looking for. Like, if, if I were to go through here and be like, these are the, my favorite songs. It would be Birth and Death, Dark Matter Gods, which oh, I, I, love that I, I song, think is dude. a great fucking song. That's and my favorite song on the album. Probably it's my second favorite. I I think it's probably the closest they came to like their uh, pale folklore or even Ashes Against the Grain kind of sound. Like it just it just flows very nicely. I think well, from start that's... start to finish. Here's my note on Dark Matter Gods. Yeah. Heavy heavy metal Joy Division. Yes. It's it's very it's a very cool song, you yeah. know. And it's killer. Celestial Effigy is pretty awesome too. Lead single, I think worth mentioning. Uh but I think Aesop Decker kind of takes the joy out of it a little bit with his like he, he plays like these really fat sixteenth notes on the hi hat. And there, once again, it's awesome. It's all great. It's all good. But I think it kind of detracts just a little bit from it sounding like Agalock and it, it sounding like the more simplistic drumming, which I think we keep coming back to that, you know? Right. And then Veils Beyond Dimension, I think, is kind of similar to the Astral Dialogue in that it's, it's a more forgettable kind of... Uh, trying to be black metal, trying to let Aesop Decker show off kind of song. It's, and once again, still good, still a great song. It's just, you know, not specifically Agalock, but then Plateau of Ages, I think, is a, is a great way to end. And I think, like, Jimmy, I get your uh, cr criticism of that song, for sure. But I think you have to look at, at it in the concept, you know, within the, within the concept within the context, within the context of the album. And I think it fits the album perfectly. And it's probably the most cohesive, like, summation of this record. And there's a, just that one, like, it's the high guitar, like... The tremolo picked high the guitar. The tremolo thing, picked yeah. high guitar at the very end when yeah, it was just, just, like, drenched in melody. Washed. And drenched in reverb and it washes over I, you i swear the the three strongest songs plateau of ages dark matter gods birth and death of the pillars of creation yeah i agree. really helped this album a lot for me and there's not like as i said there's not a bad song on the album they're all good to great it's just you're right if you're looking at it as aglock it's not the aglock you want to look at it and i it i'm constantly struggling with Am I am I letting this band get away with this one, or am I being too harsh on it? It's I go back and forth, you know. But so that's why it's like it's a light eight, you know. It's it's like it's still a great album, but it's not like one that would be like, oh yeah, this is one I hold in high regard, you know. So yeah, I, um, it's, it, it's an interesting end, for sure. If it, yeah, I mean, it would appear that it is an end. It doesn't sound like they're mm -hmm. gonna they're gonna reform. Um, a couple quick notes, very similar to yours, Logan. Birth and death, just fucking heavy, plotty, Dude. dense, thick. Funeral doomy. doom almost. Yeah, fu yeah, very funeral doomy. Um, the classical guitar interludes, they're cool. I don't know that they add a lot. The guy's a great player. I don't know that they yeah. add much. But um, astral dialogue, heavy, almost death metal riffs. Really dig it. Joy, heavy metal, Joy Division, Dark Matter God, probably my first favorite. My second is probably Birth and Death. Last would be uh, Plateau. Although I really like Veils, and the reason I do is I, I really hear some some rush like stuff going on there. As far as those chordal, they're almost proggy. That's almost a prog song for them on Veils. It's just got this, I don't know. It's just got this progness to it that I hear. 
and plateau is you know that's the the monster epic and i'll tell you what i hear a massive amount of explosions in the sky on this song and the ending five or six minutes it's just so explosions man and i will say i saw explosions one day i don't know if they're together anymore i don't think they are but um i saw them was coming back from new york and seeing uh steve wilson's band with aviv geffen blackfield and we drove by we were heading to my buddy's place in dc we drove by the 9 30 club which sadly doesn't really do rock shows anymore but the place there was so many people outside we drove up outside just to see who was there and i jumped out was asking somebody who's playing and there's they're like explosions in the sky i'm like oh and he's like yeah but it's sold out and i heard somebody go Hey, got two tickets. I ran over and grabbed them quick. And my buddy parked the car. We went in and saw two shows in one night. And they were fucking amazing, dude. And that place was packed. There must have been 1,500 people in there. It was nuts. But yeah, that that is very explosions-y. Um, and Veils Beyond. I just, I really, Veils Beyond Dementia. I really like that tune, man. It's very dreary. Again, a little bit of the Joy Division vibe to it. Um, I'm going to go on this one. I'm going to give it an 8.5. Um, I love the production on it. It's fat. It's thick. It's doomy. It almost sounds like John's down tuning a little bit on this one as opposed to playing in standard. I don't know that for sure because I didn't try to figure any songs out. Um, so, you know, and tying this all up, um, you know, I mean, would I like to see him get back together? Sure. Is the magic going to be there? Who knows? Probably not. It rarely is. Every now and again it happens, but it rarely is. But, um, you know, I did see on Holmes Instagram, which he posts to not regularly, but regular enough, more than I would have thought he would have. Um, in fact, he posted something today on a story of him driving somewhere while he was driving. He, he showed, I don't know what, what it was, something. I think it was the uh, master for uh, a solo album that he's putting out. Did you huh? see that? Called Blood and Stone or Blood and Iron or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I tried to listen to some of it. And it's I don't know. Nah. I haven't really spent enough time with it to really tell you. But I mean, like most of Hom's like solo stuff, I've never really been crazy about. Okay. You know, it's it's mostly like kind of like some of his earlier stuff is kind of like ambient stuff, and now he's doing like kind of an outlaw country versus. I was wondering. It seemed like that might be what it was, outlaw country, which is kind of unusual for him. But it's like mixed with like ambient, and it's oh. really, it's kind of weird. I mean, maybe it's really good. I haven't really spent enough time with it, but well, uh, I think you know, it, if I was honestly, if I was feeling better, I think I would have reached. I, I would reach out to him and say, "Hey, would you be into talking?" But I want to read this thing that Ryan's friend uh, he sent me the link. I want to read that, um, and I'll try to post it in comments if I can. Unless, although he said he did, but I don't know. I don't know. He said he posted, but I don't know how he he posted it. In well, I did. Um, I heard uh, there's a a podcast out there um, with Don and Jason and John. Oh, oh really? Yeah, when they re-released the uh, of Stone Wind and Pillar, uh, the new vinyl pressing. Oh, so recently, then. Okay. Yeah, if you look it up. Um, wow. And they they talk about the uh, the EP and. Uh, oh wow! They, they seem to. I'll be friends again. And okay, I'm gonna go hunt that down. Then. Dory, you know, but Likewise. like they, they they say pretty much mostly in in the the podcast that not gonna happen not, again. No. Well, they may all be in different places at this yeah. point, and and maybe yeah. even different states. And because I I'm not so sure. It looked though from the the video today of home, it looked like he was in Portland because it was raining really hard. But you know, I mean, it just had that look. I don't know, but um. Yeah, I don't know, man. It, it you know, it's a special band. I mean, clearly, all three of us. It's really cool for me to see a, a fairly young guy like you, Logan. I mean, you're young because you're not that much older than my oldest kid. How old are you again? Twenty nine. Yeah, you're two years older than my my oldest kid, and so it's kind of like it's just cool to see a younger generation that kind of got turned on to that and dug in the way that Jimmy and I did twenty some years ago. I mean. You know, you're talking literally almost a quarter of a century ago when Jimmy and I got into this band. Well, for me, it was 21 years ago. And, you know, it's just a special band. I only wish I would have gotten to see him live. I kind of fucked up there. Um, just is what it is, you know. But uh, um, any final parting thoughts from you guys? Like, 
give me some words of wisdom to go out on. Well, I will say the first time I saw them live, I saw them three times, once for uh, Mara the Spirit and twice for the, the Serpent. Um, you know, because they weren't really a touring band until pretty much Mara the Spirit. I think that's when they really first started to extensively tour. At right. least in the U.S., like they never did any U.S. tours before. Right, exactly. They did European stuff, but yeah. I will say that when we saw them for that tour, it was at the Bluebird Theater in Denver, and uh, it was magical, man. I mean, they really and and Aesop was the drummer at that. He was the new drummer at that point, and uh, yeah, they did really? a lot of they did a really just a great mix of uh, you know, all the records, they did a lot. Do you of remember album. what they did? I was going to say, do you remember what they oh, did? Oh yeah. I mean, they did, um, they opened up with uh, limbs. They did ghosts of the midwinter fires. They did three tracks from uh, pale no. folklore. They did uh, hallways oh, of the chant of ebony. They did, oh, wow. Uh, wow. they did as embers dress the skies. They did dead winter days. They did, uh, how long is set, man? Because it was long. long, long, long. Dude, it was long. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they like headlined hour so and a half. Yeah, they did in the shadow of our pale companion. Wow! They did, wow! They did. They did uh, our fortress is burning one and two. No way! Uh, it was. Wow. It was a lot. It was. It was magical. It was really a lot to know, take they, in. Damn! They were burning like the wood smoke. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the vibe. Everything was was there. You know. Yeah, they they focus a lot on setting the vibe. You know, like. Mm -hmm. For them touring, they only brought like maybe one, or when I saw them, they only brought one band out with them. So it was, you know, mainly about them yeah. and them bringing the vibe with like the, they had like the deer, deer skull and stuff and everything, you know, all the skulls on the stage and candles and stuff out there. And then as I said, the fog, the fog machine just working you know, on one band. It was awesome. They played the melancholy spirit too in that kind of close out their set and that was amazing amazing one one band that uh we didn't bring up surprisingly when we talked about how agaloc was somewhat of a catalyst for that cascadian thing was i think somebody in chat mentioned it i can't remember who it's way back but wolves wolves first album came yes. out in 2002 and i don't know when they first formed they might have been right in that sweet spot of those bands forming in the late 90s and whatnot and uh but you know Pale Folklore beat beat the first Wolves album by four years. Well, three mm. years. Um, so there's definitely some, you know. And I hear, to be honest with you, although everyone says that Uada sounds like Migwa, they do. But I also hear, to uh, to a, an extent, I do hear the uh, heavier side of the heavier, more melodic side of of Agaloc as an influence from, for Uada. They're from a similar location. Too. Right. Yeah, that, well, Portland, yeah. right? I think I think yeah. Uada's from Bend, I believe. But um yeah, um Mario, that we mentioned, I believe uh Ryan was, or did you Ryan mention did. that? One no, of you guys Ryan mentioned did. it, yeah. And they're right. I mean, there is some similarities there the weakling stuff which would have been even that would have even predated Agaloc, but they have a much yeah. more harsher sort of thing on the black metal side of things. So, um, but yeah, man, um, super cool, Jimmy, I really appreciate you being available and, you know, I, I got to give you a break. I know, although gore guts, gore guts, but the good news about gore guts is there's only five albums in one EP. So, you know, I'll talk to you about that and see where you're at in a couple days. And, uh, Devin and I know we want to we want to try to tackle it sometime soon, relatively quickly, and we're gonna Serge and I are gonna jump into and Doug we're gonna jump into that No Man uh, stuff with Wilson next weekend, um, which I'd invite you in, but you don't really know it, so this would be a good one for you to kick back and watch and, yeah, and sort of absorb, that, yeah. because I yeah, gotta dude. tell you, I went and listened to some No Man to break up the the. Uh, monotony of Agalot over the last week or so. And man, I totally fucking forgot how amazing that band is. Um, it was just some of the most hard to categorize beautiful music you'll ever hear. And again, we were talking about it and I know, um, thanks Nick. Um, I know we were talking about it with, uh, uh, Mariano commented on a post I put on Instagram about 
the right uh the rights of spring from talk talk very unclassable band the last three albums of their career no man's kind of like that um they got more and more like talk not talk talk so that's another one we're looking at then you know, logan you and i got to talk about yeah yes i'm here for y'all yeah 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 so, well i will say man thanks for doing this one because you know this is a, a very important band for me and uh you know i i really enjoyed just like hearing you guys Logan, I really enjoyed hearing your. Uh, oh yeah, awesome! Uh, Thank you, dude. I think you had a lot of really cool stuff to say about the the band, and um, you know, Logan, Logan, things. you stepped up hardcore tonight. Really, I, I was hey. super impressed with what everything you brought, and Ryan brought some cool stuff. I felt bad. Oh, yeah. I feel like I feel like I scared Ryan into being way more concise than he wanted to be, but he also was looking at the time. I think he had plans. He had to get into it you know nine o'clock out is yeah way, he so. usually doesn't hang out for two you know like big big long you know yeah we, things, we had him for about three and a half hours so that was yeah that was super cool but it, but it was very meaningful for him to join because he was really really stoked about doing this so well you know, thanks for yeah. i mean i'll tell I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the truth real quick um i'm getting a little bit of a delay that's why i'm talking over you a little bit i'm getting a weird delay in the background it's i don't know where it's my headphones probably um I wasn't, this wasn't what I planned to do like early on like this, but because of my circumstances, I'm like, well, and frankly, Jimmy, this one was for you. I wanted you to, to do this one. I really wanted to do this one with you on board. Uh, and when you ask about Ryan, I was getting really like, oh, fuck, man, I'm over committing like usual. And then I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. We're just going to do it and I'll figure out a way. I'll either shut the hell up, which I knew I didn't have to as much tonight. And I didn't have to muzzle anybody, which was great. So, yeah, kick ass. Well, I, I think we did the, uh, the, you know, for me, like this band is worth, you know, really deep. In, I, I mean, I could, yeah, I could have spoke for hours about those first three records, you know. So, um, <laughs> I think we did the band the do, and I think it was done very well tonight. So, yeah, I, I do mean, too. It really worked. I mean, yeah, very, very cool. And I'm sorry that Eli, if you're watching out there, if you're still at work or whatever. I would imagine by now you're out of work. It's 11 o'clock your way. Um, sorry you didn't make it, dude. Would have loved to have had you. We'll figure maybe something else out. Um, maybe we'll do a Devin Townsend deep dive. Oh, fuck. No, did oh, I say that out loud? No, I didn't say that out loud, did I? Jesus better, Christ, that was yeah, 14 hour stream. Spoiler. 14 hour stream right there. Yeah. <laughs> you got to break that shit out at least. Oh, a man. Of sets there. Yeah. But. Dude, Jeff, thank you for hosting. I think as Jimmy said, this is just was a very meaningful and just important, like, you know, discography for me to discuss. And I think whenever, like, because I'm, I'm still fairly new to, like, being on streams and being on, like, right. the, the YouTube community. And whenever, like, I would think about hypothetically doing it, this is one of those bands that, I would always like fantasize about like I I would just love to talk about Agalock and how much they mean to me and how much their music just stands out, you know, in in the scene. And it's just cool to have the platform to actually do that. So Jeff, I, I appreciate you and, and I hey man, I'm really just had a lot of fun on this stream, man. It was fucking killer. I know you've been doing a lot lately. You've had a lot of late nights, and you're up late again tonight. And you're probably pretty beat, and uh, I'm yawning too. So that's unusual for me, even though I got up. I, I I hate to say this, guys. I think I got up at eight thirty yesterday, oh. eight thirty at night. I tried to fall. I fell asleep around noon for about an hour and a half, but there was shit going on here at my place, and so I'm. That's why I fell asleep right before the stream. And when I woke up, it was like three minutes of it. I was like shitting bricks. I'm like, I, I kid you not. I was so out that when I woke up, my heart was racing. And I was like, what do I do? I don't know how to get on. The, like, I forgot how to open up StreamYard. I'm like, how do I? I'm going into YouTube trying to find the links. And I'm like, <laughs> what the hell? I could not clear the cobwebs for a little bit. It was weird as hell. So, but yeah, Thank man, I appreciate all your input, guys. It was great. Again, thank Ryan for me. Uh, if you speak to him. Jimmy, tell him it was great having him on. And um, I'm going to read that article and probably crash here soon. So, Nick, thanks for joining. Frederick, thanks for joining. Uh, who else do we have? Anybody? Kevin, thank you, man. Mariano, Pedro, all you guys. Thanks a lot for your input. It was cool. And uh, you guys have a good night. All right. You guys rock, man. man. It was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Peace out, guys. Good night.
All right, hang on one sec, guys.